Hey, you crazy cats. 42's live streams and videos are simply not available on vinyl. You will have to go to the YouTubes for that. So if you want content about British traditions and culture, cutting edge social commentary from an unapologetically patriotic perspective, along with a side order of madness you simply will not find anywhere else, then this is the place for you. And to all those early adapters in the chat, don't forget to hit the notification bell. That's how you get the good stuff and make sure you never miss a tasty treat. So with that being said and done, squeeze yourself in. Let's get into it. You know you want to. Good afternoon, good morning, good evening. Please delete as applicable because the internet is worldwide and time zones are indeed a thing. Can I get an audio check in the chat, please? I want to say some hellos. I'm a G's Oliver straight in there. It's a proper strong one. I do like our better robber originally. By Jesus, you have been chatty in here. You just have. <laughs> Don't worry. A bird that breathes fire and spits out destruction. Spit fire by public service service broadcasting. Very good. I like that, Don. I'm not going to read all the comments, but yes, they're lovely comments, Don. Uh, we all Vincent Griffin's in. Ragnar Arnspear, what about you, chum? 77 Brigades here. Keep us all nice and safe. The Budgie Burger's in. Packer, what about you, chum? Rory Herbert has been uh, divulging and he's got some stories that we'll probably get later on. Uh, oh, gee, yes. <laughs> I knew Rory would have a story involving Spitfire. Fuck. Of course he does. Of course he does. Bass, what about you, chum? And Dawn's in, and that seems to be everybody. Uh I think Sansom had the night off streaming tonight. Uh, oh, or Steve Crane, what about you, Sean? So not only was there no stream previous to this, it also means that I didn't get Sansom's list of the housekeeping. Nah. Rags is in. I'm going to guess Rags is at streaming tomorrow evening. Uh, half seven, eight o'clock ish. Uh, I don't know, Rags, if you stick in the chat who you've got on as your guest, I'd give that a shout out. Uh, yeah, the pro the, the crack time would do well as well. Uh, so if you can stick that in the chat, I will give it the shouts. Uh, with more people sneaking in, Streaky Bacon's in, Maximilius, what about you? Toff Toffee's in. Ha, see, Toffee's getting the info out. Rags, copy Toffee, do what he's doing. Sansom, Sansom's busy. We're doing Monday with DJ. Right, so there you go. Uh, you'll have Sansom, Toffee and DJ tomorrow night. Or, sorry, Monday night. Uh, I won't because I'll be on night shift. But this is what happens. Uh, so there's that. The other show I want to give a shout out to is, as always, the Waffling House. Oh, John Davison. Uh, I think Tuesdays and Fridays, and when he's up to it, although that seems to be more often than not now, because he seems to be very well on the mend from what I can see. To be honest with you, I haven't caught any of his streams lately. Uh, I've had a bit of the busyness. Uh, but I have seen that he's been streaming, so that's always a good sign. Uh, Scott, what about you, Sean? And, yeah, the Waffle House. Half past eight. Every weeknight. Bit of waffle, bit of drivel. Uh, if you, I don't know if you could all say empty of some pictures of the goddamn sky. Uh, so you can get the calendar contest up and running properly. That would be good. Uh, 
I would have uh, sent them a picture of the sky, but every time I looked up, it's just fucking plain grey. Uh, get a nice picture of the sky. Uh, you need a nice sky first. Streaky, uh, I'm not sure if I say hello to you, uh, so I'm going to do it now, just in case. What about you, chum? Uh, Matt D, what about you? Oh, we've got Spitfires, we've got Croft's Doghouse, we have uh, King Edward the Martyr, who was murdered uh, for the cause of change of king. And we will having we will be having our yearly reminder that comes around this time of year. Every year you get your yearly reminder. Patrick was not a saint. He's an imposter. Don't be celebrating St. Patrick's Day. It's all bullshit. Uh, but we'll leave that at the end. Uh, Bass is saying uh, yesterday's brother stream was epic. Yeah. Uh, if I do get time on a Friday night, I tend to be sorting out and doing my research for this show, uh, which is why I can't get to it. Uh, but there you go. So I think that's us all up to date. And I see Dave's Waffle House has uh, he's been in there lurking. So that's all good. And with that, we're going to get into our first bit of content. If I can just find my links. It's always good when you find your links. And by links, I mean the actual content for the show I don't mean uh sausages uh that are not square in scotland uh so there you go i want to get a look and see how this looks on the screen uh steve christ put the link in for john davison so if you don't generally go there you're not subscribed go over and have a look and um, or oh, dave's waffle house link in there as well steve christ doing a good job Getting out the links and well, he has sneaked in. What about you? Nah, here we go. Only share screen. And it's a Spitfire screen. The only one screen. Let's see. I think I want this a little bit larger. Right, that's as far as we're prepared to stream in. I'm going to have a check on this on the screen. That's looking good. No. Yes, I came to, I was looking through stuff and the cross has been going since the late 1800s. And Therefore, I'm classing it as a British tradition and a cultural event, although people do come from across the world. Matt's telling us that uh, Spitfire is easy to fly in a uh, flight simulator. Carl's arrived then. Evening. And you like? So good, got lots of people coming in. We're sitting with 25 people watching this, watching my madness on a Saturday night. Who would have who would have thunk it? And there's Angle in, evening brother. One moment, I'll get your comment up on the thing. Evening brother. Right, well, the three patron saints of Ireland. You've got Patrick the imposter, who was never sainted. You've got Columba, whose claim to fame is that he had a conversation with the Loch Ness Monster, uh, who also was not a saint. And, oh, what the fuck did you call him? Bridget. 
uh, the female one, Saint Bridget, who was actually canonized. Uh, I'm not quite sure what I can't remember off the top of my head what she did, but uh, there you go. Right, let's start on the Spitfire. Spitfire, the history of the Spitfire's design and development. A masterpiece of aerodynamic engineering, the Spitfire was among the finest fighter aircraft of the Second World War. Military archaeologist Keith Robinson celebrates the iconic design. And here we've got a little picture of a Spitfire. Spitfires have hit the ground, touched the sea, bashed through trees, cut telegraph and high tension wires, collided in the air, been shot to pieces, had rudders and parts of their wings fall off, and yet made safe landings with or without wheels. So wrote Australian Spitfire pilot John Vader. So from a pilot's point of view, these things were quite durable. And that's quite important whenever you're fighting a war and people are fucking shooting at you. You want something that doesn't just explode on the first impact. R.J. Mitchell, the Supermarine Spitfire's designer, learned his trade during World War I. He was conscious of the fragility of the early planes and always considered pilot safety in his design. Even when designs were optimised for speed, such as those of the Schindler Trophy races, he never sacrificed his concern for the pilot. His masterpiece, the Spitfire, proved to be not only a beautiful plane, much loved by its pilots, but also a robust and adaptable design. It was also quite easy to repair because of the way it was constructed uh which has got a lot to do with why we actually won the air war it was in fact so adaptable that it was the only fighter in production before through and after the war everything else that we produced for that war by the end of the war was obsolete and spitfire was still going it eventually reached mark 24 some of those marks being specialist photo reconnaissance planes, others reserved for the Navy and christened Seafire versions of the Spitfire were equipped with machine guns, cannons, rockets, and bombs. It could be used at high altitude or adopted as a ground attack plane. Two marks were even tried with floats. By the end of the war, it had gotten through 13 different designs of propeller. In all, 20,351 Spitfires were produced for the RAF. That's the end of the bit written by Mitchell. Mitchell's search for an effective fighter interceptor did not get off to a very good start. His Supermarine Type 224, with its steam-cooled, Rolls-Royce Griffin engine could only manage a top speed of 230 miles per hour against the Air Ministry's rather modest specification F7-30 for an all-metal four-gun fighter with a top speed of 250 miles per hour. So it was only doing 230, so it wasn't fast enough. This ugly duckling was was named Spitfire by the managing director of Ficker's Supermarine. Mitchell, however, was already working on a much superior design, the Type 300, and went into collaboration with Rolls-Royce, who, who were themselves working on a new engine, which would eventually become known as the Merlin. So this is where we're starting to get things come together, uh, the Merlin engine and the Spitfire. At first, a private venture was taken up by the Air Ministry, whose fighter spec F-16-36 would be written around the design. So it looks like they actually <clears throat> found the aircraft they wanted and then put the specification for the design so that the Spitfire would uh, be the one that was chosen. And with that, I'm going to take a quick look at the chat.
So I'm just checking through comments. How do you remove a real powerful and nimble? Lofer, what about you, Sean? Oh, Don saying, my paternal granddad, <clears throat> who operated a Sherman tank, never shut up about Spitfires, and my other granddad, who made jet engines at Rolls Royce. Yeah, they had a whole story or two between them. Right, okay, okay. I um, think I'm fine with all of that. Uh, here we go. Work began on the 300 prototype, Air Ministry registration K5054, in December 1934. It underwent its maiden test flight at Eastleigh, Southampton, on the 5th of March 1936, which is why we're doing it this week. In the hands of Fickers, Chief Test Pilot Joseph Matt Summers. K5054 had a narrow fuselage with wings that tapered two cylinder tips and were elliptical, and its cockpit was enclosed. Its undercarriage was set close together to lower stress on the wings, and the wheels slung outward to retract flush with the wing cavities. Suspension was provided by oleo legs, which were telescopically sprung on oil and air. The tail skid completed the technical arrangements for takeoff and landing. The plane was originally fitted with a two blade fixed pitch wooden propeller and the Merlin C engine. At C as in the ladder, not the wet stuff between the land. Unfortunately, Mitchell died of cancer in June 1937. He continued to work despite increasing pain, twerking the sign up to the moment of his death, earning himself the posthumous sherbet, the first of the few, from the makers of his 1942 film biography. Before he died, however, he had seen his prototype fly. Production design and future update adaptations were therefore the work of Mitchell's longtime collaborator and successor Joseph Smith. It was Smith who overs oversaw the production of production trials at Marshallton Heath, but the Air Ministry, impressed with the prototype, had already ordered 310 Spitfires despite the problems with type 224 and the name stuck. There's another little picture. By Mark Bromley. After consultations with the RAF technical experts, the armor for the new Spitfire fighter was settled on eight Browning 303 machine guns. These were basically Colt 30s manufactured on their license but re chambered to take the British rimmed cartridges. They were placed four to a wing, a novel concept at the time and designed too far outside of the circle of the propeller, doing away with the need for <clears throat> interrupter gear of the earlier aircraft. So in World War One aircraft, you had your pilot with a machine gun sitting directly in front of them, and it fired, it was rigged up to fire between the movements of the propeller blade. Uh, other because if you didn't do that, putting the machine gun there was, would only uh, serve to shoot your own fucking propeller, and that's not good whenever that's what's making your aircraft fly. So the Spitfire moved them out on the wings, don't need to worry about the propellers. So there you go. <clears throat> Smith also simplifies the construction of the sign to make the Spitfire more amenable to mass production. He was fine and was finally brought Mitchell's idea to the practical conclusion when the first Mark I 
number K9789, officially entered service with number 19 squadron at RAF Duxford on the 4th of August, 1938. Lone Though the first few planes had only four machine guns, as there was a desperate shortage of brownings. The early Mark 1s had a service ceiling of 31,900 feet and at 30,000 feet could reach a speed of 315 miles per hour. Its maximum speed was 362 at 18,500 feet. Its maximum cruising speed... <clears throat> though was 210 miles per hour, 20,000 feet. So that's basically what it was designed to do all day, every day, while it was out looking for the Germans, and then get a little bit quicker whenever it went in for the kill. And that economical speed, its range was 575 miles. Its combat range was 395 miles, allowing for takeoff, and 15 minutes of fighting. Yeah. The reason why you only get 15 minutes of fighting, partially down to uh, fuel, and the other thing is aircrafts need to be light in order to fly. Ammunition is heavy, so you get they pick an amount that sort of Neither gives you excellent flying, but uh, still allows you to do the, it's a trade off. So yeah, 15 minutes. And I think they had around about 11 seconds worth of uh, fire time. By the time the Spitfire brought down its first German plane, a Henkel, H.E. 111 bomber over the 1st and 4th and 16th of October 1939, several improvements have been made to the Mark I. Its elliptical wings and all metal mushy hue body where the skin is part of the plane's structure rather than just a covering had been added and bulged or blister shaped cockpit there by completing the Spitfire's classic profile. The windscreen plastic had been replaced with armoured glass. Armoured plate was fitted at the rear of the engine bulkhead. A power operated pump was installed to operate the undercarriage and the tail skid had been replaced by a wheel. The Merlin Mark II engines were given way to the Mark III's with its improved air screw shaft and the two bladed wooden propeller have been replaced by the de Havilland three bladed metal two pitch propeller significantly enhancing performance particularly in the climb. Remodeling and rearming. Most of the Spitfires with which the RAF fought the Battle of Britain were Mark I's but work had gone on bef- on a Mark II as soon as the first model had gone into production and some were already in service as early as the summer of 1940. There was little difference between the two Marks, the main one being that the Mark II Spitfires were filled with the Merlin 7 engine rated at 1,150 horsepower. The Spitfire Mark II had slower maximum and cruising speeds, but a faster climb rate, being able to reach 20,000 feet in seven minutes, and had an improved ceiling of 32,000. The Mark II had a better had better protection for the pilot as well, with increased armour behind the pilot's seat to protect his head. See, in the earlier model, they put armour plating behind the engine to protect the engine, and it's only whenever they have it up in the air and it's going on the battle that they uh, think, oh, maybe we'll give the man flying it a little bit of protection as well. <clears throat> Another early development which led to increased Spitfire Ferrari was the production of different types to accommodate 
a range of different armament setups. The A wing was originally was the original one designed to hold four 303 machine guns. The B wing was designed to accommodate the newly accepted hips that used a 20 millimeter cannon. So each wing had one cannon and two 303 machine guns. The C or universal wing could accommodate either the A or B combinations or an altogether new combination of two 20mm cannons. There was no D-wing, but the E-wing was created, which carried a 20mm cannon and a 50-inch machine gun. And with that, I'm going to check the chat. Right, Max is trying to get his followers up on Rumble in order to be be able to uh, uh, be able to stream. So, if anybody wants to follow him on uh, Rumble, Steve, could you find Max's Rumble link? And um, if you can, stick it on the chat, please. So we could do that. BNSPQs then. Wolfie's Naturalist is in. Yeah, many uh, many European patron saints do come from Britain and Ireland. Uh, it's because the Irish went out and spread Catholicism at uh, uh, quite the rate. I'm just doing a quick check through the comments if there's anything I need to. Yeah, nothing really I really need to get involved in. Rory. Uh, yeah, there there will be there will be a quick call in so you can get yourself in then. Or if you want to, if you want at the end of the Spitfire bit, I'll bring you in then if because you've got some Spitfire specific stuff. Uh, one moment though. Here we go. I'm not sure how far down this is. Right. 50 Mark 1Bs were manu 50 Mark 1Bs were manufactured, but there were problems with the feed to the cannon. By the time the Mark II was ready to enter service, this problem had been sorted. Of the 920 Mark IIs made, some 170 had the B-wing com combination, so it wasn't that common. The most continual program of updating and improving the Spitfire, the next most significant development was the Mark V, with a production run of nearly 6,500. This was the most common type ever produced. They were manufactured mostly in the B and C versions. Some with the universal wing were given four cannons that could carry one 500-pound bomb or two 250-pound bombs. They were also fitted with drop tanks, of 115 and 175 gallons, significantly increasing their endurance. Now we've got some info here. Uh, the length was 29 feet 11 inches. The wingspan was 36 feet, 10 inches, and four machine guns on each wing. Going from back to front, you've got a rudder tab, got a little tail wheel there, uh, on a shock absorber. You got the rudder tab. This wire would be for making the Manipulating the 
the rudder and making it move so as the plane goes different directions. Uh, parachute flares, don't know what they're about. There's a wireless in there. You got the plate and skin, and then you've got all these stringers uh, going down the way and across the way, which is the same way we built an aircraft today. Uh, sliding coil on the cockpit. Petrol tanks just in front of the pilot. Yeah, because in the wing where you're you're playing on your your fuel on a normal plane today is in the wings. Uh, this is directly in front of the pilot. <clears throat> Uh, there's retractable wings that fit in the uh, end of the wings, which is taking up a lot of space. And then you've got machine guns and shit in there, so there's not much room left for petrol. The Mark V Spitfires were powered by the Merlin 45 and 46 engines, producing 147 brake horsepower at 1600 feet. These new, more powerful Spitfires were the Air Ministry's response to the introduction of the Major Smith ME109F. One second, I need to get some liquid and to cough. <laughs> it's basically the same setup as Streaky's Moped. Classic. And the Fock Wolf FW190 in the spring of 1941, both of which clearly outclassed the Spitfire Mark II. The Mark V AS could reach a speed of 376 mph at 19,500 feet, at which height the Mark V-B speed was 369, whilst the Mark VCs reached 374 at 1300 feet. The climb performance of the Mark Vs was improved, being able to reach 10,000 feet in three minutes six seconds, with 30,000 feet in 12 minutes 12 seconds. The Spitfire ceiling was also raised by some 2,000 feet. The plane performance improved on both sides. As the number of roles the aircraft were asked to perform increased, so the Spitfire proved its versatility as a new range of designations was introduced. Those Spitfires designed for high altitude work were given the prefix HF, high flying, those for low altitude, low flying, LF, and for normal duties, F just flying. The high flyers and low flyers were given variations of the Merlin engine specifically designed for their tasks. The high flyers were distinguishable by their extra long wing tips, whereas the low flyers had clipped wings. Developments and updations continued to the end of the war with the Mark 6 I'm guessing that taking over from Mark Fives. No, that's a Mark Nine. Uh, as the most commonly manufactured plane of the later series, with some five thousand five hundred produced, of which more than ten thousand went, uh, which more than a thousand went to Russia. Increasing numbers of Spitfires were also being sent to the Middle Eastern and Far East Eastern theaters. So the aircraft got around fucking everywhere. Sorry, people, just getting a bit of liquid. Experiments have been ongoing with new Rolls-Royce Griffin engines. The first of the production Spitfires with these engines was the Mark 12, I believe that is, with the Griffin 3 or 4 followed by the 
Mark Fortain with the 250 Griffin 65 driving the five blade ruler propeller. The Mark Four tens have a maximum speed of 443 at 30,000 feet and could reach a height of 12,000 feet in just two minutes 50, 51 seconds. And the quicker you can get off the ground and up up in height, the safer you are whenever people are trying to shoot you down. It was the Mark Four tens which the first Allied plane was the Mark 14, which was the first Allied plane to bring down a Major Schmidt ME262, the world's first operational jet fighter. So this propeller thing was going up against jet fighters. The appearance of the ME262, however, showed the way to the future. After the war, designers everywhere turned to the production of jet engine fighters, and the Spitfire's post-war service was brief. And there's a nice little picture of two Spitfire pilots in a field having a little bit of rest. And with that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do two things. As long as there's a hungry hungry child or a child in need of home, there should never be another war weapon made, period. Any questions? Yes, I got a question. See whenever you totally defund your military and uh, the country that hasn't defunded their military comes along and takes you the fuck over. Uh, it's not just going to be that child that has a problem. It's going to be every child and every person. So, uh, yeah, I have questions about the application of that and how it works in a world where you cannot get everyone on board. <laughs> Devonzi nuts. Uh, right. So I'm just checking through this. Right. Yes. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do two things. First thing is, I'm going to stick a. Lincoln for Mr. Rory Herbert. If you want to come on and tell us your Spitfire stuff now, there's the link in there for you to do so. And the other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to do I'm going to put up a little video of some Spitfires flying past. We'll have a look at that and we'll see if Rory's coming in. How's that sound? Uh, I'm not going to watch all of this video, uh, but I'll watch a bit of it and see how it goes. Right, see the stripes that you can see underneath the wings here and the ones on the body? These are the invasion stripes. So every aircraft uh, post invasion uh, for D Day, uh, pre invasion for D Day, you all got those uh, painted on them really fucking quick so that it would be easy to distinguish 
any allied uh, aircraft that was taking part on our side in the invasion. They are actually quite beautiful. Uh, right, I'm going right, to come back to this. There you go. There's a little bit of flying. Uh, Mr. Herbert, what about you, Sam? 42. I'm, I'm okay. How are you? How are you doing? No, I, I'm sorry to interrupt your stream. Oh but, God, no! Um, don't don't be sorry. <laughs> uh, you know, do, do, I mentioned Sir Douglas Barner, um, who obviously flew the Spitfire. He was the the legless fighter ace, right? Uh, you know, who was who was captured in uh, in in World War Two. I mean, he shot down a few planes, but yeah, um, uh, the he the sent him the coldest that they not. Say again? They sent him the coldest. They did, yes, at the end of the day. But um, I mean, prior to that, prior to that, forty-two, um, the the Germans um, they accepted because he lost his legs when he got, when he got out of the plane, and the RAF sent some new legs to the hospital. And yeah. had an agreement with the Germans that they wouldn't shoot the plane down that was delivering his new legs. Yep. You know, so it's not, it wasn't total war. You know, the, the RAF and the Luftwaffe, you know, they had respect for one another. Yes, they did. And they did. let them do that. Yeah, the, there was that uh, there was that respect between the the flam people. Absolutely, uh, absolutely. I mean, what I was going to mention, I was, I was going to send you a, a little chat, but I, I was going to say, I, mean, I was at boarding school in the, in the seventies, and I, I attended a lecture by Sir Douglas Bader. Um, and not only did he talk about his wartime exploits, he also spoke his but his time in South Africa later, we actually defended apartheid. He thought that was wrong. Now I might not. That might be bad to say that on on, on the channel, but that's what happened. That's what he said. So I really think he knew what he was fighting for. Yeah, he was fighting for the the British people, the indigenous. Yeah. It's it's really hard to know with uh, a lot of these people what their politics were. A lot of people just went, Germans bad, we're, we're let's go. Uh, it, that one is hard to know. Uh, sorry, what did he say about apartheid? Douglas Potter, he supported apartheid. He thought that was a good idea. That's what he said to me back in the United States, or said to the audience. Yeah. To be fair, probably I mean, was. We, we, we might get into two on well, YouTube. This might be difficult. But. Well, I'll, I'll tell you what I can say. I can say that a system whereby people have separate 
living areas, separate education, all of that does not necessarily need to be exploitative. You can't just do your own thing uh, without exploiting people. Uh, and I think possibly South Africa could have possibly done a little bit better on not exploiting the indigenous people. Although I don't, and by that I mean on an individual basis, like the idea that a job pays X amount, but you're this type of person, so we're going to pay you less. I don't like that idea. Uh, but with regards to the, the thing that's commonly going on about, like uh, South Africa's got the largest diamond mines in the world. and Very exactly. Yeah, right. Well, um, yeah, 42, please, please. I, the last thing I want to do yeah. is, is interrupt yeah. your stream. Right, yes. I, I, I just thought, that because it was a Spitfire stream, yep. I'd like to tell you about when I met Doug, Sir Douglas Barner and what he had to say. Yeah. Um, and that I, oh, oh, I also passed his car. This was a funny one in London. He was, do you know what an Alvis motor car looks like? Alvis? Alvis motor car. Yeah, it, it's a little car from the 1960s, 1970s. But I actually I, saw him in London in his car. And he'd, he'd actually put um, a little concord on the front of the bonnet. <laughs> <laughs> so it's like, ah, that's, that's Douglas Barnett. But, I mean, he died in the early 80s. Unfortunately, he passed away in the early 80s. But, um, no, I, yeah. Yeah, a great man. I, I have so much respect for him. Yeah, I've looked up Elvis, and there is such a variety that there's nothing going to be obvious. Is it like a racy car? No, no. Uh, no, not at all. No, it's a sort of saloon, two-door saloon car. Toffee is is Toffee's causing me trouble in the chat. What's he? Toffee, he says, what are you Rory, doing? Roy, Roy, tell us a made up story. He thinks I'm making <laughs> this up. Toffee. Yeah. We this know, is, yeah. We, Rory tells us true, honest stories. He's he's met all these people that he says he met. And, <laughs> anyway, oh, uh, forty two. No, no, no. Carry on with your stream, please do. Right, yeah. No, uh, so so at this stage, he, was he going around different schools, sort of telling them about his wartime exploits and uh, other bits about life? Well, yes, I think he did. I think he was. I mean, obviously he was paid yeah. for it. Yeah. You know? Um, I mean, he came from my school, which was Harrow's school, quite a famous school. Which yep. church or went to that school? Um, and yeah, I'm sorry, he did. Yeah. Well, one second, I need to cough. Well, that would actually make perfect sense because you've got somebody that is a genuine war hero, uh, was up in the airplane, lost both his legs. Uh, and decided to, yeah, fuck that not having legs and just get this thing adapted and I'll go back up and have another go at these people. Uh, that's a very special and rare type of determination. Well, I mean, if you think about it, for the term, I mean, gosh, I mean, you know, your aircraft gets shot down and then you have to pull your false legs off, parachute out of an aeroplane without your legs. Yeah. I mean, that must be the, one of the most difficult and horrible things to do in your life. Oh, well, yeah, then land on your hips. Well, it's, yeah, exactly. You've got no legs to stop you from your parachute jump. Yeah, and the uh, how they how they take the bump out of the uh, landing from a parachute is by using your knees as shock, shock absorbers. He don't have none no more. Well, exactly. You know, that's... Yeah. 
you know, plus whenever you whenever you jump out of aircraft, you have no idea what's waiting for you on the ground. Uh, most people will be attempting to run away pretty far, pretty fast. Uh, he can't do that. You know, that's uh, a really rare type of determination. Well, I've never, I've never flown a Spitfire. Mm -hmm. um, and to tell you the truth, I've never jumped out of an aircraft. But my brother, my brother has his, his own little light aircraft. And, uh, and that's quite scary. You know, because he does all these barrel rolls and loops mm. and loops and things. I tell you what, no, I would not want to jump out. Definitely not. Yeah, no, I don't fancy uh, getting out of a perfectly fine working aircraft. But anyway, look, 42, I've gone on for far too long. I've interrupted your stream. I'm terribly yeah. sorry. No, Tom you're... Fanning was asking me if I could come on and talk about my experience with... Um, with the man, but um, anyway, you, you, you carry on. I'll leave. Um, right. I'm sure you've got a lot more to talk about tonight. Well, so. that, that's pretty much the Spitfire bit done. So uh, I've a couple of other bits I'm going to do, and then we'll possibly have a quick call in. Depends how fast I get through this other stuff. But uh, yeah, thank you very much for coming on and telling well, thank you, stories. Thank you, thank you for letting me on. This. Uh, some ridiculous comments in the chat, but never mind. <laughs> never mind. There we go. No, no, I'll leave you alone. I'll, I, will, yep. I will leave now and, and let you carry on 42. You're a good man, sir. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Roy. And as always, you're very welcome on. And I, ignore what Toffee said in the chat. I enjoy your stories. No, uh, that's right. I love <laughs> so, it's okay. Toffee. No, no, we love Toffee. Yeah. No, to good man. Toffee's just a wind up merchant. I know he is. Yeah. <laughs> From somewhere up north, God knows where. All right, I'll, I'll let you carry on for you. Right, thank you okay. All right, thanks very much. Right, that was Rory. <laughs> I'm drunk. Have we jumped over the Spitfire now, making contact with the French resistance? Have we wobbled? Uh, no, we didn't get quite that far. We didn't get quite that far indeed. So pretty much there's your background to this to the Spitfires. We're about coming up on our end. And I think we will have uh what is becoming a traditional musical interlude. I just get a little song up. I can get some liquid in and get regenerated and ready for the next thing. Uh Yep, we'll Google this one. Right. One second. Need to get rid of a couple of tabs. Right, that's us. We're more sensibilized. <laughs> we're these nationalists. <laughs> Right, people, Berkey. Yep. That's how we say it. The devil went to Jamaica. He was looking to sell some weed. He was doing fine. They were standing in line. It was excellent weed indeed. When he came across this young man who was likewise peddling pot, and the devil slid down the beach to the kid and said, Boy, let me tell you what. I guess you kind of figured I'm a reefer head, of course. And after all this time, I guess that I'm a connoisseur of sorts. Now your stuff smells okay, but this could tranquilize a horse. I'll bet a million in cash against your stash because I think mine's better than yours. The boy said, my name's Johnny, and you ain't smoked nothing yet. One hit of this grass will kick your ass. You got yourself a bed. Johnny, roll a ball of hash and make sure it's the bomb. Because the devil's got the kind of stuff they smoked in Vietnam. You'll get a million smackaroos in cash if you can cope. But if you can't, the devil will get your dope. The devil
devil packed a bong with a little Acapulco gold, and resin flew from his fingertips as he fired up his bowl. He filled that chamber all the way, and he took a mighty hit. As they passed it back and forth, it gave them both a coffin fit. <laughs> Damn. When the bowl was finished, Johnny said, Hey, man, that stuff was great, but fill your lungs with some of this and prepare to vegetate. Cannabis sativa, sweet Mary Jane. The devil's in the backyard frying his brain. Zigzag filled with a diggity dank. Hold on tight, it'll hit you like a tank. The devil nodded off because he knew that he was stoned, and he asked if he could buy an ounce of the stuff that Johnny owned. Johnny said, devil, just come on back if you ever want to catch a buzz. I done told you once, you son of a bitch, mine's the best there ever was. And they fired up doobies one by one. Ain't it gonna stop till the bag is done. Green as a bullfrog, sticky as glue. Granny, do you get high? Yes, I do. There we go. That's our little musical interlude. And now we're going to move on to the Crofts and the Doggy Show. Is this where I found out I've got the pants link and not the good one? We shall see. Uh huh. Right. Going to make this a little larger. <laughs> Streaky like <legs. laughs> Oh fuck. Spanish chicken, what did Ukraine win? I'm thinking nothing. Right. The Crofts Doggy Show. Let's explore the history of Crofts Dog Show. Crofts is the greatest dog, the greatest dog event in the world. Organized by the Kennel Club, the show celebrates every aspect of the role that dogs play in our lives. Crofts hasn't changed in ways of Crofts has changed in ways that couldn't possibly have been imagined when the show was set up in Victorian times by the late Charles Croft. Although it was a very different event in 1891, Charles Croft was a great showman and we surely have enjoyed the size and scope of the event today, which has become an essential date in any dog lover's calendar. The dog show is still an important part of the event, celebrating the unique relationship that the dogs share with their owners. Judges are trained to ensure that only healthy dogs win prizes, which in turn encourages the breeding of healthy dogs. Right. Crofts and the Kennel Club. The aim of the Kennel Club is to promote in every way the general improvement of dogs the kennel club team works hard behind the scenes to achieve the same and also towards making a difference for dogs they are the largest the uk's largest organization dedicated to the health and welfare of dogs the objective of the kennel club kennel club today holds with the broadest remit to protect and promote the general well-being of dogs at its heart are programs and investments in education and health initiatives which lead to happy healthy dogs living long lives with responsible owners cross is ultimately a celebration of all dogs it celebrates working dogs which are fit and healthy enough to perform jobs for which they were originally bred such as those in the Gamekeeper Classics or which line up for the police dog team, operational and humanitarian action 
of the yearly award. Crofts also heals hero dogs through the Friends for Life competition. Rescue dogs are celebrated in the Rescue Job Agility competition. <clears throat> and the speed and agility of dogs is celebrated in the ever popular competitions of fly ball, heel work, and heel work to music. Heel work to music. I think we're going to have a look at look for that in a moment. For prospective dog owners and dog lovers, Crofts is a prime opportunity to talk to Kennel Club, assured breeders, rescue charities, breed experts on how to responsibly buy, train and enjoy life for your dog. And of course, hundreds of trade stands selling everything and everything for dogs and dog lovers. So here we got the history of it. Crofts is named after its founder, Charles Croft. In 1876, young Charles left college with no desire to join the family jewellery business. Instead, he took employment with James Spratt, who had set up a new venture in Holborn, London, selling dog cakes. Charles Croft was ambitious and relatively short, and, and a relatively short apprenticeship as an office boy led to a promotion to a travelling salesman. This brought him in contact with large estates and sporting kennels. His next career move with Spratt saw him travelling to Europe, and here in 1878, French dog breeders, perhaps seeing the inter, in, inter, entrepreneurial, um, ultra, entrepreneurial talents, and Croft invited him to organize a promotion of canine section in Paris, a canine section of the Paris exhibition. He was still just two years out of college. Back in England in 1886, he took up management of the Allied Terrier Club show of, at the Royal Aquarium, Westminster. It was 1891 that the first Croft show was booked into the Royal Agricultural Hall in Islington, and it has evolved and grown ever since. So, in 1881, there was a first show. 1918, 1920, Crofts not held due to World War One. 19. I'm just going to skip through these. Ah. Uh, so, Best in Show arrives. First female owner of a Best in Show was 1932. Was uh, called off the Second World War between 42 and 47. 48. The Kennel Club takes over. The first Croft show under the Cannon Club auspices takes place after Emma Croft gives over control. Held at Olympia, it proves an immediate success with both exhibitors and the public, with 48 breeds entered almost double the number of the breeds from the first cross in 1891. Since then, Croft has increased in stature year by year and now attracting around 200 breeds annually. 1950 is the first time it's televised. Uh, in 1952, uh, death of King George VI, Cross is held two days late. In 1955, Cross becomes an obedience championship show. Working sheepdogs are entered, becoming the first crossbred to compete at Crofts. Crossbreed dogs are now a central part of the show, taking part in a wide range of competitions, including agility. 1972, during the winter of discontent, Crofts 1972 takes place under subdued lighting and with an abbreviated catalogue due to the three-day working week, which had been enforced. As one commentator says, for two days every visitor was able to forget the troubles of the world. Uh, nah, what was I wanting to look up? One moment, though. Sorry for doing this on the fly, people. Uh, 
we're going to have a quick look for Dog Heel Work the Music. One moment, though. Right. We've got one. Uh, these. Can I? Right. Here we go. We're going to have a look at this. Stop screen, present, share screen, share screen. It's their very first freestyle competition. Once I had a little dog, I called him Cracker Jack. He had a spot around one eye that looked just like a bat. His legs were way too long and he was awkward as could be. He wasn't much to look at, but he looked all right to me. I found him by the riverbank just wandering about. He was cold and hungry and his ribs weren't sticking out. I snapped my fingers, whistled when he came, I picked him up. I was just a kid and back to judge. I took him home and fed him till he couldn't eat no more. I took him to my room and put a blanket on the floor. After that, beside my bed is where he'd always sleep. Each night in my prayers, I prayed the Lord his soul to keep. Cracker Jack, the best friend that I ever had was Cracker Jack, but he was more than that, a playmate, a companion, he was love and understanding, that was Cracker Jack, the best friend that I ever had was Cracker Jack, but he was more than that, everything a kid could want I had in Cracker Jack. Cracker Jack would run to meet me after school each day. He'd jump and wag his tail and look at me as if to say, I love you and I missed you and I'm glad you're home again. I knew just how he felt cause me and Cracker Jack was friends. Through the woods and fields we would often roam about. When we got in trouble we would help each other out. I could run almost as fast as Cracker Jack could run. We had a lot in common, and we had a lot of fun. Cracker Jack, the best friend that I ever had was Cracker Jack. But he was more than that. A playmate, a companion, he was love and understanding. That was Cracker Jack, the best friend that I ever had was Cracker Jack. But he was more than that. Everything a kid could want, I had in Cracker Jack. He was always with me when I was growing up. We shared each other's good times and we shared each other's love. He only lives in memories now, but often I think that. To the days of childhood, the days of Cracker Jack. Cracker Jack, the best friend that I ever had was Cracker Jack. But he was more than that. A playmate, a companion, he was love and understanding. That was Cracker Jack, the best friend that I ever had was Cracker Jack. But he was more than that. Everything the 
Uh, to crack the there we go that's some doggy he'll work uh i actually thought that was very good and the dog's obviously very well trained that must take fucking hours and hours and hours of work so there you go there's a little bit about crufts well rags is like Nuff. so dawn <laughs> Look for him not even putting that up on the screen. <laughs> yeah, that's a smart doggy, but it is funny. <laughs> yeah, so there we go. That's a little bit about Crofts, which is now a British. Uh, tradition and event and all that sort of stuff. Now we're going to have a little look about, at Edward the Martyr. Right, here we go. Edward the Martyr, this is coming from Historic UK. Um, move this up a little and let's see what it looks like in StreamYard and that is small. So we'll zoom this in. I'm going to zoom out on again. Right, here we go. In 978, a young English king was assassinated less than three years into his reign that would become known as Edward the Martyr. So, on the 18th of March, 978, a tragic incident occurred. The young king of England was slain at Corfe Castle having only served as king for three short years, from 973 until his early demise in 978, when he became known as Edward the Martyr. Uh, a lot of these Anglo-Saxon kings had, like, three to five year reigns. Uh, the, we had a batch of three of them, uh, all around five years each. Born around 926, Edward was the only son of King Edgar the Peaceful and his first wife, Ethelhead. Whilst he, whilst he was the first son, he was not the acknowledged heir to the throne as his father had remarried twice and was now settled with his new queen, Ethelruth, with whom he had another son, Ethelred the Unready. As half brother to Edward, and with a mother who was now queen, Ethelhead was a valid contender to the throne. After Edgar's death, a family dispute over power would emerge, leading to an unimaginable turn of events, which even today is shrouded in mystery. So we don't know exactly quite what happened here, but look, apart from the fact that the guy died. And we're not quite sure exactly who was behind it. The saga be began in 975 when Edgar the Peaceful passed away, leaving Edward just 13 at the time. So 13-year-old, 13-year-old uh, kid, yeah, go rule England. That's a fuck. That's a head fuck. As heir to the throne. However, his legitimacy was called into question and disputed by people who supported his younger brother to take up the role instead. Because, yeah... You're not even nine, and you're going to be king. Yeah. Athelred was indisputably also a legitimate heir to the throne. However, he was only six or seven when his father passed away, making his older brother the more likely choice. Nevertheless, as both sons were very young, their bids for power were strong, strongly led by court factions. And in the case of 
Ethelred, his mother was keen to see her son as the rightful heir. There's a little picture. In due course, Edward was chosen to be the next king of England and crowned with the help of the Archbishop Dustin of Canterbury, who represented represented Edward's strong clerical support base, which also included Oswald of Worcestershire, who served as Archbishop of York. Edward was chosen as king. Not much is known about his character and thus the ability to lead. Well, he was 13. What do you expect his character to be? At the time, differing accounts from important figures paint conflicting pictures of the young king. According to Bifenreth, who was a priest and a monk based at Ramsey Ambe, he had a bad temper which affected those who worked with him and created an atmosphere of fear. Yeah, because telling 13 year old he's in control of everything is gonna that that's not gonna end up with a tarrant no definitely not of course not this account however is refuted by osborne of canterbury who was a benedictine monk and who commented on edward's character in a more favorable in more favorable terms noting that the men around him led him and held him in high regard these two varying accounts of his character only contribute to the mystery of the intrigue of the king in his short reign. I'm going to take a wild guess that those two people, one was in support of him and one was in support of someone else. And that's why you've got different uh, opinions about him. And in that regard, the way we... Uh, uh, slander politicians and royalty today is no different from back then. His ascension to the throne took place amid the power struggle and his reign did nothing to ally fears of treachery, violence and disorder. During his three years in power, the so-called anti-monarchistic reaction took place which involved members of the royal court taking their opportunity to reclaim power lost during King Edgar's reign. Edgar had decided to increase the land ownership and power of the church, thus angering secular landowners in the process. The nobility found Edward's weak reign as king as a perfect time to seize control, leading to attacks on monasteries and property belonging to the church. And around this time, the Vikings were coming over doing raids and stealing all the stuff out of the churches. Uh, so the church wasn't having a good time because now they're getting the, the local people on them. Uh, where was I? Uh, The dispute was escalating and civil war lately. Edward's leadership was not strong enough to deal with current events, even with the assistance of the powerful Archbishop Dunstan and the seizure of and the seizure of monastic estates continued. All in all, Edward's time and power was marred by crisis. Uh, just wanted to do a quick check on the comments. I'm honestly not sure what time uh, Exc the, the Excalibur legends and stuff take place in, so I'm not sure. In March 1978, Edward made his faithful decision to visit his half-brother in Corinth Castle. He arrived in the evening accompanied by only a small group of men who were met at the gates of the castle by Ethelwaite's retainers. According to the chronicles, this was quite unusual. Having alerted members of the household to his impending arrival, he would have been expecting 
a welcome and accompaniment into the castle. Unfortunately, this did not happen. Events that followed have become enveloped in secrecy, marred by clandestine reports and cryptic accounts. The assassination took place at the gates of the castle, as Edward waited to be allowed entry, perhaps being offered a beverage of mead whilst he waited. It was here that the dark deed was committed. Edward was still mounted on his horse when he was mercilessly stabbed, dying on, on his horse, which subsequently bolted into the darkness of the night, dragging his body along the ground. Oh, that's not good. No one really knows how these events played out. What is clear, however, is that an act of murder and treachery was committed that night which had enormous repercussions for the throne, for the kingdom, and Christianity for years to come. So he turns up at his half-brother's castle, instead of his half-brother coming down and saying, Hello, king and brother. Come on in. Let's all eat and be merry and stuff. Uh, He held him outside the gate and got somebody to stab him. Or his mother did, because... One of them was 13. One of them was about 16. One of them was about 12. Uh, I think there's uh, adults involved in this shit. The Anglo-Saxon Chronicles has become the main source for this period, in particular for this event, with the Peterborough Chronicle manuscript describing the sad events on 18th of March thus. Men murdered him, but Godox exalted him. In life he was an earthly king. After the death he is now a heavenly saint. Uh, I'm going to take a screenshot here. I want to look into this Anglo-Saxon chronicle. Is this like the first I'm spitballing here but it's, this would be like the forerunner of the newspapers or whatnot that sets out what happened. So I'm quite interested in that and I will do a little bit of research. Edward's murder was said to be on the orders of a stepmother who intended to put her own son on the throne. Although unproven, Ethelred and her factions, including Ethelred's main advisors, appeared to be the most likely perpetrators of the assassination as Ethelred was too young to have orchestrated such an event. Another key figure possibly implicated in Edward's demise was Athelwer, one of the main conspirators in the anti-monastic movement. Some have taken his involvement in Edmund's <clears throat> reburial as a display of penance for the murder. That being said, the responsibility for Edward's Edward the Martyr's death remains a source of intrigue with power, politics, and wealth at play. Initially, his body was placed in a grave near Wrexham without any of the of the pomp and ceremony expected of a royal burial. A year later, his body was disinterred and taken to Salisbury Abbey to receive a proper <clears throat> ceremony. And then, 1001, placed in a prominent position in the Abbey as by this point he was considered a saint. See, whenever the the Catholic Church wants to make somebody a saint, they get their ass in gear and they canonize them and they become a saint. Just saying. King Edward would become, King Edward would become known as Edward the Martyr, a representation of an innocent victim slain for power and prestige. His martyrdom status secured by his untimely death. His status as a saint, however, was induced by the miracles that were said to have occurred at his tomb. His remains were said to have been miraculously intact, a sign of sainthood. His veneration followed, and to this day, Edward the Martyr's feast day is celebrated on the 18th of March, the day of his mortal demise. During the death oh, Here's the other thing, and they actually know when this guy died, unlike some other saints. Well, not saints. During the dissolution of the monasteries, the bones were removed from the resting place and hidden. 
1931, bones were discovered in the ruins of the Abbey, said to be Edward's. Today they reside in the Orthodox Church of St. Edward the Martyr in Brook, Brookwood, Surrey. His martyrdom as a good Christian at the hands of others who were considered irreligious has allowed his sainthood to be glorified and celebrated since 2001. To this day, many of the Roman Catholic Church, the Angl- Anglican Communion, and Eastern Orthodox Church recognize and celebrate him. So there you go. There is Edward the Martyr. So that's all that stuff. <clears throat> and we're an hour and a half in. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to stick the invite in. Anybody wants to come in for a chat, please do. Um, we'll have a chat and a comment and whatnot. And while we're waiting on somebody arriving, I'll give you a quick oral history of Patrick of Ireland. There's Pakistan. I expect it'll take longer than that. Hello, mate. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can indeed. Even, uh, sorry, I was uh, a bit distracted there because I was reading Sylvia Dot the Dot's comment, uh, which is, did you ever hear about rats? The crossbred dog that lived in the barracks with the British Army who took him under his wing during the Troubles. I have a book on him. He was so loyal. Nope. I've, I've heard of a couple of stories of animals like that and would be quite interested in that. Uh, yep. Yeah. So, I haven't the short, short answers. Uh, Sheila is no. But uh, it is interesting. Paco, what about you, Sean? Hello, how are you doing? I'm doing okay. Uh, Real fans, you want to jump in, please do. I was just going to say, I had the uh, pleasure of living in a small village called Coningsby in Lincolnshire a while back, where I worked in a nursing home. Yep. And they have an RAF base there, and that is where they keep the Lancaster, the Hurricane, and the Spitfire that do all the flyovers. Yes. So I, I saw them. Comment about that. I saw them on the absolute regular. You could hear them coming a mile, well, several miles off. And I would immediately down tools and go out, <laughs> stand yeah. in the garden and watch them. Um, I did well, one one sunny afternoon. I was out doing the gardening, and there was the Spitfire and a Eurojet, and they were dogfighting. It was fascinating to watch because the uh, although the Eurojet was like you know far faster, four, oh four six times faster easily, yeah. But as soon as he got anywhere near the Spitfire, the Spitfire just turned around. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the the other thing is. Uh... The idea in dogfighting is to try to get behind the aircraft and chase up on it. Now, if you're a little bit faster than the other aircraft, that's very good. If you're a lot faster, you've caught up with it and went past it before you've had time to react. Yeah. Yeah, well, the the, 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 the uh, modern jet fighters... It takes them, like you know, a good couple of miles to turn round. Yes. Well, the, you know, comparatively, the Spitfire was like a taxi cab. Yes, it could. It was very, very, very uh, maneuverable. Right. While you're in, I'm going to take a, around about a minute and do a quick oral history on uh, Patrick of Ireland because. I said I was going to do that. I wanted to do that. Wasn't expecting you to jump in just as quick. But anyway, you know me, I'm all over it. Yeah, you were. You were on like a tramp on a sandwich. Anyway, very quickly, Patrick. Uh, some people say he's from Wales. Some people say he's from Scotland. Nobody says he's from Ireland. He was brought over. Uh, he was kidnapped, brought over as a slave, worked as a, a field hand escaped back to Scotland or Wales, depending on which version of the story you got, then came back as a minister at the behest of Pope uh, Clementine. He ministered to the people of Ireland, 
he is credited with removing the snakes from Ireland. And to be clear, the snakes are not little wriggly creatures. The snakes are the pagans. Uh, for example, Boudica, uh the ancillary who fought the Romans, she had a serpent on her shield. Uh, a, a snake was uh, a very common pagan sign. So Patrick is credited with uh, removing the snakes. The removal in part or in whole of a religious group is indeed a genocide. Uh, so everybody that's painting themselves green is celebrating a genocide. The Vatican never canonized them, so he's not actually a saint. Whenever he died, apparently his body was put on top of a donkey, put in the well. There was a battle between the Ulids and the Unil, uh, or the, the Ulish, uh, who would be native of Ulster, and the Unils over the body. Uh, there was a fog or a river, depending on the variation that you decide to believe, and they disengaged. Then Patrick was taken to either down Patrick to be buried or somewhere way down south to get buried because there's two graves. Oh, uh, there's also a bit of confusion between Patrick and Patrick, uh, who was sent by Pope, uh, I think, 100 years earlier. Uh, so there's, it's all very clusterfucked. He's definitely not a saint. And it's the biggest sort of bullshit holiday in the Western world. There you go. There's your oral history of Patrick, and um, if you want the uh, if you want the full version of it, uh, in the description is a link to the ins and outs of it from last year, Patrick of Ireland. Toffee, what about you, Chum? What about you, Chum? Enjoying the same as ever, mate. Uh, oh. As you've just said, uh, as you can imagine, St. Patrick's Day, unfortunately, is going to be a big thing on Merseyside. Yes. Most of the time, it's going to be painted green. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I was over for a Liverpool match many years ago, many, many years ago. Uh, actually, it was about this time of year. And it was coming near the end of the season because it was the last match with the standing cup at Anfield. Uh, we played Chelsea, we beat them 2 1. Uh, but in a pub after the match, somebody said about I bet your Belfast is banging uh, for Patrick's night because it is here. And I was like, I, No, I, I'm not <laughs> seeing any Patrick Day celebration whatsoever because. My community just don't do it. <laughs> but yeah, there'd be a lot more going on in Liverpool this weekend than there is in well, it's became a thing in Belfast now, but uh, you know you know we spoke about it before, forty two. You know all about the Derry Club and the yeah. orange marches through Liverpool. Mm -hmm. This uh, like honestly like say if I ever get into discussions on Telegram or anywhere. I almost feel like when someone's sticking up for the, we're on Merseyside, so people do, when someone's like overly sticking up for the paddies, I just feel like saying, speak to 42, I'll send you the fucking link and he'll fucking tell you what's what, you dickhead. <laughs> yeah, there, I've seen, uh, there, there's a parade in Liverpool that actually goes past Anfield. Because I'm, um, I've seen video of it over a number of years of the Orange Parade going past Anfield. And I'm thinking that's actually, you know, we don't, uh, we don't see, it doesn't get publicized. Oh, we've got more people coming in. We've got a real Vincent Griff Griffin and we've got a Rory Herbert. Vincy, Rory. Toppy, Vincent, Rory. Vinci, my absolute bestest mate. I've, I've recently just I, I disappear from the internet every so often, and I got back on Telegram the other day. And Vinci's my mate. I've recently just I disappear from the internet every so often. Right, who's got the echo? Vincent. I'm muted. 
Vincent, check that you don't still have the YouTube running. And what you've said there, 42, so, so like the, the, it's a small area, so it's the orange march. So you've got, you've been to Anfield yourself. The, yeah. It, there's literally just Stanley Park. It's a mile away. Yeah. Goodison, and it's literally a mile away. People don't believe how close it is, but it's literally just opposite kind of thing. Yeah, you you walk through the park. Uh, the distance between Anfield and Goodison, yeah, what was it forty three points? No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but it is literally, <laughs> it is literally the other side of the park. Literally. And there was plans to move Anfield a little bit towards Goodison. Well, we, well, we've well, got this new stadium, haven't we? Uh, sorry, anyone to go into sports world, but we've got this new stadium that's right by the. But it's it's Bramley Moor Dock. I, I mentioned on Dangerfield stream like a good few months ago. Yeah, you you know the trouble ever ending, don't you? Yeah. Currently, yeah. <laughs> so we got this new stadium that's getting built. We got a post deduction. Blah blah blah. I apologise anyone who doesn't like sports ball, just quickly. So we got this new stadium right by the dock in a like a prime bit of real estate. Is, but, is that like Albert Dock? No, yeah, like a lot further over, but it's on docks, a few, a good mile away. So we've got it there. You, unless you lived there, you wouldn't realise there's a sewage treatment plant bang next door and I mean bang next door it's next door to Bramley Dock so for so like it's it if you ever been to Spain and it stinks of shit if you ever <laughs> noticed that like the sewage it stinks of shit Spain really? this area constantly stinks of shit <laughs> like there's just this weird smell in the area and we've oh, got fuck. we're gonna end up the fucking club that stinks of shit <laughs> Oh, like the songs just write themselves. I'm telling you, mate. <laughs> the the songs for that will literally just write themselves. Uh, shit team, shit ground, shit smell. <laughs> <laughs> mate, yeah. honestly, when we move into that stadium, I'm just going to block you and just break off all contact. I can't take the banter. <laughs> um, um, Mate, I'm I'm sorry, I'm trying not to, but that, <laughs> that's a penalty kick. Because <laughs> I've seen I've seen pictures, uh, photographs and video of that new stadium. It looks a fucking class job, like. Yeah, it does. Uh I will say that the ta- that the the banks of the start look quite steep. There's there's loads of there's funny jokes going around because it's it's literally on the banks of the Mersey, so Liverpool fans are making jokes like there's going to be a lot of balls ending up in the Mersey. <laughs> yeah. Well, you can paddle it in your canoe and get them. <laughs> That's it, me me kayak. <laughs> yeah, get get your kayak out and. Uh... <laughs> I'll be, uh, I'll be ever since you ball boy. <laughs> yep, for for sale. Uh, five match balls, slightly damp. <laughs> well, anyway, well, you know, sorry, yeah, you, no, that's right. You know, forty-two. I I wanted to, since Toffee has jumped on. I wanted to ask you: Has he <laughs> ever taken his savages to uh, to crafts? No, um, I'm I'm good friends with. There's a a, a club called the East Anglia Staffordshire Bull Terrier display team, and they're quite a big thing. And they display their dogs, the staffies. Do you know the um the displays where they run through the little hoops and the little yeah, you know absolutely. what I mean? Like what? Yeah, yeah, they run over that. I'm good friends with them, but none of my dogs ever there. I've got two. The weird have, staffies. Has staffies has... are like two different breeds. So it's because okay. it's a Staffordshire Bull Terrier. Yeah. They're either more bull or more terrier. 
So you get ones that are like short and squat and a bit fat, or you get ones who've got long legs who are athletic. And two of my dogs are like that, and the other ones are like short, squat, fatty ones. So, so I, tell I took tell them me, down there. Go on. Yeah, tell, tell me, Toffit. I'm, I'm really interested in this. Does, does craft just allow, like, regulated breeds? Or, or will they take crossbreeds? Yeah, it's the same thing that they do crossbreeds now. Yeah, so, it's 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 pretty open now, bro. It's yeah. To be honest, I, I would. So you could have as a, a, as a, I would like it as an extremist. I would like them to be breeds. To be honest, so, right? Okay. Quick question then, topic. Um, has a staffy ever won crafts? No, but the there's different competitions. The wonder display ones. So, so you'll have like the show ones where they just show them, and you'll have like right. an athletic competition. Staffies oh, are one, man. But oh, right. okay, right. Yeah, because right. whenever you whenever you get on the things like a best of show, it's always going to be one of those poncy ones. It's always one of yeah. the poncy show jobs. But did you see them, fat lads? The, literally right. the other day, there was a, a, do you know one of these fucking dickhead, like extension rebellion type people? They came onto the Crufts Court and got carted off. Did you see that? No, I like messed a process. Up. It's cruel to dogs. Oh, you see, th- this is where somebody needs to let a staffy go. Uh, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there, I swear to fuck, there was, uh, there was people broke into army bases to try to free the uh, army dogs because that's cruel and they opened the wrong cage let's say because they decided to make free and peace with an attack dog and (laughs) yeah (laughs) yeah Let's say that there was a lot of blood to be found in and around that place the next day. They, they've got it. Just it's just a it's just a like, like, they, They've got the some ridiculous idea. Sorry, Pat. They've got some ridiculous idea that almost that keeping a dog on a lead is cruel. Like it's a dog. We're in charge of dogs. They, they've gone really extreme. The lefties. They're fucking weird. Have you seen, like, abattoirs? We all... Yeah, Packer, you're fucking prime example. Meat eater. We all eat meat. Have you seen these fucking extremist lefties who go into, like, abattoirs and slash the tyres of people who work there? And, like, this is just people who work there, you fucking freak. Get a grip. Oh, what about the... Uh, I've worked uh, in an abattoir as well. I do love my meat. It's the fucking... The deflators that are uh, running about letting you already all the 4 by 4 tires. I've also got a 4 before. I'm starting to feel like a bit of a target here. Yeah, but... <laughs> it, it's not our fault that wingdings are going after people that are involved with the same similar stuff that you're involved with. We're we're not saying it's a good thing. Uh, we think these people are fucking idiots. Uh, although, I swear to fuck, see if where I think they went wrong is see whenever these people started gluing themselves to things, we should have just left them. Yeah, it, it's really easy. Put uh, you've glued yourself to your train. Very good. Off you go. Next destination. Let's see how you if you let's see how long it takes you to fall off. My favourite joke I saw recently was there's a massive asteroid heading towards Earth that's going to destroy the planet. So the government introduces an asteroid tax. Disaster averted. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> um, forty-two. Out of interest, talking about avatars. 
Um, my primary school was opposite an abattoir. Um, there were, you know, many girls who would try to ride their horses past it, and you could see the horses. They would not go past it. They really had to be forced on. Yeah, they can on, smell it. They could smell it. They knew what was going on. It was like, whoa. You know, they're not silly, these horses. No. They're, they're not. The ho horses, dogs, there's a lot of animals that are highly intelligent. You know, and they know what's going on. Uh, I, I do, that, actually. Like, as an animal lover, I do question myself sometimes because I've seen... I've seen the way it gets produced, and it does seem cruel, but it's just it's just the fact that I've got incisors. I'm a meat eater. That is just literally my natural form. But as an animal lover, I, I do struggle with it sometimes. It, I don't... Uh, I can't well, stand people being cruel towards animals well, more than anything else. I, I can't stand it. There's, there's farm butchers uh, over here. And you can go to the farm, you can go to the butcher shop and you arrive at the place and you've about 500 yards through fields to get to before you get to the uh, the actual shop and they have like a restaurant and stuff and it's all good. But uh, you're driving past the cows and stuff, uh, walking about in the field, they all seem perfectly happy. And then uh, whenever you get inside the shop, you see them cows uh, pre uh, presented as sticks. You know, I think that you can ethically treat animals decently and also produce them, harvest them for food. Yeah, well, 100%. Well, yeah, 42, to reply to Toffee's statement, I mean, why do we why do we breed pheasants? All right. Part of it is the fun of going out and shooting them, but at the end of the day, they are for food, and they wouldn't even survive, you know, if we didn't want to shoot them and eat them. Yeah, exactly. I mean, exactly. It's, 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 you know, same with cows, sheep, you name it. Just it's just a little bit more fun shooting a pheasant than it is killing a sheep. Yeah. And it's a fact of life as well. There's instances where we have to call them. So there was uh, uh, there's something in Scotland that I was gonna get on board with, but I don't think I could do it. You can pay to stay in a lodge up right up in the Highlands, and you'll go out and shoot a stag during when the culling season's about, and you need to kill the males. And I wanted to go because it sounded like a good experience but i know for a fact i couldn't do it johnny you're sitting there with your rifle and you've got it in your sights oh. and you've got this like beautiful animal yeah i couldn't well, do it they, um, yeah. Um, they thank you. yeah quickly um i mean young toffee is not old enough to, you know to remember the the culling of, of, of all our, our cows back in the 1980s yeah, you know, the, the foot and mouth thing, mad cows, what, mad cows disease. I mean, there were what hundreds of thousands of them. Yeah, and they didn't need to be killed. And they didn't need to be killed. It was that was I can't forget the name of the minister or ministress. I think it was. Um, but anyway, you know, this is how our government operates sometimes. But uh, yeah. yeah, just kill them all. Edwin yeah. Curry, wasn't it? Yes, I think it was. Well, yeah, yes. it was. I, I, do you know what? I yeah. thought that was Queen of Curry. She's a scouser there, the little rat. Uh, she said eggs was bad for you as well, didn't she? Stupid cow. She did, yeah. She's a horrible fucking bitch, yeah, mate. I'd probably shag her like, oh, she's horrible. Uh, <laughs> I, know oh, some, no. I know of someone that did. No. Yeah. The... You knew someone who shagged Edwina Curry? Yeah. John no, John Major. Major. <laughs> no, no, not John Major. Somebody somebody different. Uh... <clears throat> Lads, honestly, she's actually got like a fucking bit of a body on her, mate. She'd get it. <laughs> she yeah. must be fucking 80 years old now, surely. 
yeah, yeah, well, yeah, yeah, it, twenty it, years ago. It wasn't. It wasn't recently that the person that that I know was. So, right, you're fine, Matt. But your yeah, Anglo-Saxon says he had animal rights activists protest at a slaughterhouse. He worked for in Stoke. There were thirty strong <laughs> workers there, armed with their work tools, and the extension. The protesters decided not to play. Yep. That what's happening, man? Like, what you think about it? Like, there's people working in abattoirs who are just doing their job, and you get these little freakish lefties coming in and slashing their tires and smashing the windows. You're like, what the fuck? How are you achieving anything by doing that? Just attacking the small person kind of thing, you fucking rats. Yeah. Yeah, but also then, then also, obviously, we have the disgusting halal slaughter that's going on in this country, and the yeah. government seems to do absolutely nothing about that. Well, quite but, a- like right, for, uh, you obviously all know, but for anyone who doesn't know, everyone in the chat will probably know the the when we slaughter meat, we English. Europeans, you got a bolt gun. You you put a bolt against the head, and they don't even know what's happened. It's dead before it's even at the ground. Exactly. Muslims and Jews. This is a fact. They hang them upside down, and I've seen videos of it. And any moral human being couldn't possibly get on board with this. They hang. I love animals, but even if it didn't, they hang them upside down. They slit the throat and the animal dies in agony and there's just no need for that behaviour. It's savage behaviour and it should Tuffy. not be allowed. Oh. Tuffy, it is disgusting. It should be illegal. I totally agree with you. I, I've got a larger problem with it than that. See, in order to get the... See, in order to get registered as a halal slaughterhouse, you have to pay the people who run the halal business, right? Because they go around and audit the slaughterhouses. Is this halal? Is it not? And they sign you up and uh, get you allowed to sell halal meat. And then your meat then goes to a different factory that produces, turns it into pies or whatever the fuck it is and that all needs to be certified and the fees for doing that are quite high and a lot of the money that is made from the halal registrations and the register and licensure of the businesses Finds it finds its way to <clears throat> procure weapons for Islamic terrorists. Yeah, exactly, exactly, a hundred percent right. Yeah, you're right, and, mate. Yep, yeah, and the the thing is, I can I can understand. Right, we want to have a licensure system for. Uh, for this product but if we're going to allow that to happen in this country we need to have a better check on what how much money is being raised and what that money is going to and if that money is can be provably going to pay for terrorist attacks or weapons or equipment or even lodgings for these people uh, then you need to bring the whole fucking thing down uh, because we can't expect to have any improvements on our security whenever we are currently paying for the opposition. Do you know what, yeah. 42? Like, talking about... Sorry, Pat, uh, just quick. Just talking about, like, what shops you should not shouldn't buy from. My mom has got a really big being in bonnet about... Have you heard of the shop chain Londis? Have you heard of no. Londis? Yeah. Yeah. They apparently are like 
give donations to the according to me, Ma, they're really supportive of the IRA. They're like Republicans. And there's shop stuff that I don't know how true this is, but my ma has got a B in it. My ma is a Ulster Scots Protestant yeah. loony. <laughs> yeah. And she she like lit doesn't half hate this shop. I don't know how true it is. Whether what well, you said, but well, you've heard of it, well. Oh, yeah. And um, for you, yeah, I'm just going back to the halal thing. Um, one of our, our biggest issues, in my opinion, is that the education system in this country are, are demanding halal meat for their students. So I, I just cannot see that any government, be it Conservative or Labour, much the same, are, are ever going to stop that from happening. Well, here... Because the, the Muslims are demanding it in England. Yes. Well, to be fair, if you have a prescribed diet, right? Whenever you whenever you put children into a school system, and um, by the way, it's not the children's fault. Uh, children are born into family. That that is what they is. Uh, they're supposed to eat certain stuff. Then the education system has to provide it, unless. We, because the the only the only thing that you could do is this country, United Kingdom, has an official religion, and that official religion would be Church of England, Church of Scotland, Church of Ireland, uh, which are Protestant Christian religions. That's our official religion, and the king is indeed. Not only the king of the country, but he is the defender of the faith. If we were to take that seriously and decide that all primary schools were going to have a Christian assembly, and all uh, actually all all schools, you can you can put down the secondary schools as well. All all uh, all schools, all state schools will have a Christian have Christian assemblies, and they will have no. They, they will have no halal or kosher foods where we do Christian foods in those schools. And if people from other religions with other languages want to educate their children, they can set up uh, academies or whatever it is and do that on their own. Yeah, then, well. you, then you can get halal food out of our education system. But unless you're prepared to do that, it has to stay. Well, yeah, for true. I mean, I, I agree. But why is it that the education system is saying we have to have our meat? I mean, surely, surely, yeah, you know, if, you, if you send your child to an English school, then they should have the food that's on offer. You shouldn't oh. have to change your whole structure, you oh, know, to, 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 let me finish, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you know, to change it. And why, don't, sure. no, why, don't, why don't the ones who want to eat halal meat just bring in their own lunches? Yep, I was I mean, about to say what, that. Every school, every school in the United Kingdom has an option of bringing a packed lunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah but now there's a the halal vegetarian option as well, so they could have that. Yes, but, yes. No, I'll tell it. you why. Because it's conquest. Don't they're not, they're not interested in the integrating. Yeah. It's because it's conquest. They conquered us. They conquered our school system. We all know. Right. Well, it's, it's, it's anti-white, isn't it? Can I say that on your channel? Yes, you can. But here, here's the other thing. Here, here's where, here's where it goes wrong. We have. A whole bunch of people that are in our administrations, in our civil service, in our education system, uh, in all our civil society, who think that if they 
if they make concessions and get along, that the people on the other side of this deal will make concessions and get along in, in return, and we can get everything nice and happy. But what they're failing to realise is those the the Islamist uh, advocates are not interested in any form of cooperation or consideration of the native population at all whatsoever. They are. Uh, they need to be told a very blunt no this is how this works and if you don't like it fuck off and we do not have the people with we have people that are misguided enough to think that they can get along with them and it's not going to work yeah well i i agree with you to a degree where the you've got these naive lefties i've just mentioned who think this is all going to work. But behind that, you've got these, the powers that be who are, who know this isn't going to work and are intentionally inflicting upon us. And all these people who think it's going to work are just fucking useful idiots, basically. Good evening, gentlemen. Evening, Lufer, how's yourself? Uh, fine, thanks. So I'm my third pint of home brew. I thought good I'd evening, Grandfather. Good evening, Grandfather. Good evening, Grandfather. Star. Hello, Rory. It's nice to actually uh, uh, speak to you uh, at long last. I think it's more well, than six, well, seven years since we were last engaging in a in the chat, uh, not on the panel, but in the chat on somebody else's stream. Well, exactly, and to hear your voice too, Grandfather. I think it may have been the thing that brought me. Together in this collaboration, a loose collaboration, was the dictator top trumps between Sargon, Pith Elmer, and Academic uh, Agent. Could be, could be. Going uh, back to your time. Yeah. Now, Lofa, I have to ask you about your name. Uh, Sheffield. Were you born in Sheffield? No, I'm originally from Lancashire, but the wife's from uh, Rotherham. So we moved over here about 20 years ago. Okay. Because I can tell you right now, I was born in Sheffield. Yeah, yes, Rory, Rory, Rory really, up, uh, up, up the other end. Uh, you might not Nick believe Clyde that. Constituency. Uh, you might not believe that's my accent, but uh, here, yeah, Rory, I, 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 I we need to take Sheffield. up a, We need to look this comment from Anglo Saxon because Anglo saying, I want reparations from Rory Herbert. You know, my ancestors worked on one of his family's estates. <laughs> 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 that's a funny comment that's a funny comment um, I'm sorry I can't afford reparations no <laughs> sorry I thought I'd jump up because you started mentioning about halal and kosher slaughter yep. now, I know somebody that's very very close to me <clears throat> the wife that works in the state sector and she knows for a fact that all of the meat provided in her area is actually a halal slaughter even, yes. though, uh, even though that might not be a majority of people in these schools. Oh, shit, I'm just doxing myself again. Fuck it. Um, right, so even though a majority of pupils in this particular school might not actually be either Jewish, which is very unlikely given it's Sheffield, but there's an awful lot of uh, Muslim children, and they are a minority, and all of the all the meat that is supplied routinely is uh, halal slaughtered. There's two yeah, reasons. Jim, me I entirely believe it because I know for a fact that KFC and a few other big restaurants are completely halal. Right. I'll tell you why they do this. If they wish to have halal and non-halal meat, they need to segregate everything. They need they need double the amount of uh, ovens, uh, fryers, whatever it is, so that the halal meat and the normal meat doesn't ever cross contaminate and it's much easier and much cost effective for them to just have the halal meat because there's nothing stopping a non Muslim eating halal meat. Well so, it, it goes it actually goes further and beyond that you've actually oh, have separate storage spaces with yeah. separate 
fridges, very much like Orthodox Jewish tradition. You can't keep your meat and your dairy in the same fridge. You've got to have two separate fridges. Now, that's the um, Orthodox Jewish uh, or kosher tradition, and it's exactly the same when it comes to actually the storage of meats that are actually uh, halal slaughtered in storage spaces. So you've got to have separate fridges and freezers for them as well. Oh, but not only that, right? Remember the certifications that I was talking about earlier? So all those schools need to pay for the certification for their facility, which puts money into the kitty for uh, supplying the people that are fighting a terrorist war against us. There's an, hey, another think, answer. think about what it just said. They literally, so do you have to separate it? These people, li- and I, to be honest, I think the same towards them. These people think that we are disgusting. They think we're vile and they can't share food with us. They think we're the fucking disgusting and they, they need to separate themselves from us. And it's right in your face, and it fucking does my head in. Well, the the other the other one that comes on that that I've been thinking about lately is this whole diversity is our strength thing, and the diversity harsh because see, whenever you say diversity is our strength, or we need a diverse team in order to do this job, what there's what that means is whenever you translate that into fucking proper speak. They have an opinion, and the people that are pushing this, most of them are right, by the way, have an opinion that no native British person is good enough to do that job. They don't have the right humanity, they don't have the right brain, they don't have the right whatever it is, and they cannot possibly do that job. And I'm thinking, have you looked at our cathedrals? Have you looked at the GWR... uh, the great, wonderful railway that was put across this country with uh, navvies cutting out the cuttings to put those straight railway tracks through. Have you looked at everything that we've built? There's fuck all that we need other people in to do. We are quite capable of doing it ourselves. And the fact that they continually tell us that we need diversity to improve things is incredibly insulting. That's a whole uh, different area of uh, um, to, to, to discuss, yeah. right, really. At the end of the day, we know that um, all these, uh, shall we say, low-skilled immigrants are actually very low-skilled and they're a bigger drain on the economy than they are actually put into yeah. the economy. We know that for a fact they're a net negative. Oh, yeah, you just need to observe them in, in their day-to-day life. You know, the we are, we are not... If you're bringing in people from a country where the average IQ is 70, don't expect them to be sending geniuses. Also, uh, they are like, uh, just because I've never spoken to you before, everyone else on the chat I'm, I'm familiar with. I can't read your name because the screen's full. Sheffield, sorry, bro. What, right. what is your opinion on immigration? What do you think? Oh, I don't know. It's a bit. It's a bit, a bit of a deep dive. That I'm still. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, uh, somebody on Twitter uh, from Academic Agent Stream sent me a link on Twitter. And I opened it and downloaded it, and I went back to Twitter, and he'd retracted it. So it's, so shall we say, it's all rather controversial. It's a bit of a deep dive. Um, it's it's more to do with globalism and encroachment. If we can just bring it back to the real world and what us people, indigenous or people, inhabitants of these fair isles experience. Um, they, we know that n- migration from um, poorer countries is a net negative. They are not contributing into the country and they're taking out more than they actually contribute. So that has been that argument has been blown out of the water as far as I'm concerned. But if we can bring it back to um, halal and kosher s- slaughter, well, if it's good enough for the Jewish people, then why don't we allow it for the Muslim people? Um, um, so, yeah, 
it's it's barbaric and it's something which should be outlawed. Now, I would have thought that all these people, these vegetableists, to quote Jeremy Clarkson, would be in outrage about it, but they're not. All the people, they are aposomatic hair colouring, all your usual suspects, the crazy lefties, are strangely silent on this. And there's something that really brought it home to me a couple of months ago, is there's that Canadian woman. I think she's half Hindu, half white English but she's Canadian and she's called Catherine Burble Singh. Now she runs a school and it's right at the end of Wembley's uh, way, Wembley way in North London. Um, and it's a secular school and they have exceptionally good um, examination results because it's very conservative and it's very strict. Uh, and they take children from working class communities and they actually put these kids through Oxbridge um, through Oxford and Cambridge, they actually hard track them a bit like the old grammar school system. Yeah, where smart working class kids could be identified at a young age and put into the grammar school system, and it was the best way of advancing bright working class kids into the middle classes. Now, she was actually dogpiled upon because she would not allow any religious observances at her school, and that included providing a prayer room to point your mat towards Mecca five times a day. Now, she's been dragged through the fucking machine and told she's a bigot and all sorts of stuff. And Peter Hitchens also said that the worst thing that could stop working class kids advancing towards the middle class was the abolition of the grammar school system. And I just think it's curious that that woman that can't put two fucking matching shoes on her feet, Diane Abacus, um, a child actually attended a private school, a fee pay school, but it's the, the, the drawbridge has been brought up for working class kids. Now, it was abolished by the Labour Party and it was never turned on the 180 and actually reinstituted for working class communities. Now, that's going back, what, 40, 50 years. But with regards to the new influx of people, it's never right. Never right. Some it stinks. And I can't put my finger on it. But this globalism bringing all these people of limited IQ with bad social, um, you know, social habits into the system. Well, let's say I'm, I'm very curious about why our elite should have allowed that to happen. Interesting. Well, I, um, I'd, sorry, I'd, I'll explain it to you. This might be a bit, you're, you're on the right path. And I don't mean to sound patronising. You're on the right path there, like, the reason there's differences between races, we've got black people, Chinese people, like East Asians, whatnot. Certain people have managed to develop better than other people. A lot of, I'll fucking say it, black people, uh, this is a, a scientific fact. They've got lower IQs, and you can look it up. Go and look up crime, crime statistics. This is why... We know, what gonna, I know what you're going to say. We all know what you're going to say. You know, it's got, we know it's it. got a lot to do with access to the coast. Uh, societies have had access to the coast or river to the coast and interacted with other uh, nations via trading and stuff. They develop. The sooner we can accept that fact, the sooner we can move forward. It's just a fact. Oh, with, like except dog breeds. Say, I've got staffies. Certain dog breeds are more intelligent, and certain other dog breeds are fake as men. Just accept that fact, and we can move forward. Yeah, but that would mean everybody getting the fuck into reality. Um, it'll mean everyone going back where the fuck they fucking came from. Is what it'll mean. You go back. See how you can make it in Africa when you haven't got us to build your systems and build your plumbing and everything. See how you get on. Go ahead. Oh. See how you get on. The, the, other, the other issue, I have to say this, is with the universities, is they, they earn an awful lot more money from the foreign students. Oh. So, it, that... You know, it's a financial thing. Yes, because univer universities ca are capped on fees for British people. Exactly. But they can charge. They can charge whatever the fuck they want for foreigners. Exactly. And, and, and the, really the, the, British, thing, the British students, according to, 
and you know they have to take out the loan, don't they? The, yeah, the student loan thing. So that's an immediate debt. Yes. Whereas if they're taking the foreigners, oh, it's no problem. That's cash up front, or you know, over a few years. So I would. Mean, and would, you, would, you, would, you, would you blame them for doing that? But that's not what we want to do. Yeah. Well, universities have always had a certain level of overseas students. Uh, I don't think that's a problem. I think, I think we've got two problems going on with that. One is we've vastly increased the number of overseas students. Uh, I think that's wrong. The other thing is we have created diversity programs for universities um we yep. got hell bent on getting people that should never be next year near university and the universities which in the 90s resulted in fucking david beckham studies and other such bullshit uh we need to get rid of all our feminist programs all our gender programs and get back to proper education but the other, the we, other thing, the other well, thing I've heard. Hold on. Let, let me say this before we set my head. Sure. We, in, I don't know about all of Northern Ireland, but I know about the area that I live in. We have a very, uh, we, we have the same level of people coming out of Cambridge, Oxford, uh, and stuff like that with good results that we've always had. But we have retained our grammar schools. Oh, oh, yeah, we in have Northern, Ireland. in Northern yeah. Ireland. Yeah, Lincolnshire yeah. yeah. grammar school oh, right. and two thousand. Just into the chat there. So if you want to get your kids a decent education, come to Lincolnshire. There we go. Um, Lincolnshire still have grammar schools. Yep, we do. Yep, yep. Uh, how do you how do you do the P seven? Do they run their own examination? Sorry. How do they how do they deal with the eleven plus uh the selection element? They run their own exam. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, they the eleven plus. Oh, they, they still have the eleven plus. We have yeah. uh whenever Oh, we call it the eleven plus. I don't know exactly what it's you know, but it's still yeah, right. the 11 plus. right, okay. You have they've developed their own examination and it's just generically known as eleven plus. We still have that. Uh the kids go do an exam, get a result, and they either go to the grammar school or they don't. Uh, and the difference in results between the grammar schools and the comprehensive schools is fucking immense. Well, we used yeah, to. Have we we got a particular school on um, in Merseyside that was a grammar school called Whittle Grammar, which is just opposite Liverpool, the Whittle Peninsula, and it's produced. Two prime ministers, and it's apparently like one of the best schools in the country. It's not like a, it's it's not like a private school. It's a grammar school where you can pass the eleven plus and attend. Do you know what I mean? Lots of former Labour prime ministers were actually uh, products of the grammar school system. So we're going back to the education system. I know it was wrecked. One thing I'll say that the grammar school system was one of the best systems from getting bright working class kids to advance into the middle classes. The Labour Party destroyed it. The Tories never reconstituted or never reintroduced it. They got rid of the secondary school system, where it actually channeled um, children who were perhaps not academically well engaged, but bright in other ways, to actually engage with trade skills. Now, if you actually look at Germany, they still have that system in place. They had a system called the Mittelstadt, where children that were not particularly academically bright, but were technically bright and curious, were pushed into the trades. And it worked great for a very 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 long time up until recently but the reason why germany's gone down the shit all is not to do with education that's to do with global politics so basically the system in britain was ruined by the labor party the tories when they came back into power never reconstituted what could actually get bright working class kids advancing towards middle classes the education system is now funded and you get a situation where university chancellors are paid three or four times more than rishi sunak the chinese government actually send a lot of their bright kids over to study over sheffield's full of bloody chinese folk wandering all over bloody place 
So essentially, what we've done is the assets throughout the country, and whatever's left in terms of, in terms of educational establishments is being sold off globally. And basically, you know, but I think we're circling the drain. I'm sorry to put too much of a doomer on it. No, mate, mate, I'd give you that uh, absolute round of applause for what you just said, 100%. Yeah, totally um, agree with yeah. you. No, for, no for, um, I, I live near Salisbury um, in Wiltshire, you know, near Stonehenge. Yeah. And strangely enough, Salisbury has two grammar schools, and one is a girls' school, and the other is a boys' school. Oh, I, I um, they, some... share, they share classes between themselves, but they are independent schools, one for girls, one for boys. Oh, if, it's, it's... if I was in charge of education, uh, that would be the default. We have boys' schools, girls' schools, uh, primary school be co once you hit that uh, once you hit secondary school you're going to uh single sex schools and we're going to teach the girls with methods that are better for teaching girls and teach the boys with methods that are better for teaching boys because guess what they both learn differently yeah well, well, I'd exactly that. I'd exactly that in lincolnshire we have the we have the um comp uh, secondary modern and grammar school system and i went to an all boys be modern where we were sat in row rows you know singularly or yep. sometimes in pairs but that was it not sat around a table like girls learn where they communicate with each other because boys don't you see yep. boys around the table they fuck around so we were sat no, in well, rows able to shut up and listen and i learned more like that than i would have done in a room for a room half full of girls as an adolescent boy i know that for you, a fact you put teenage boys around the table and they will compete. It's necessary for them to compete. Uh, With what girls as well. 42 girls will do the same. Oh, oh, but girls, girls compete in a well, way. They will, compete, they will compete with one another, won't they? Yeah, yes, but uh, girls compete in a way that looks like cooperation and boys cooperate in a way that looks like competition. Uh, it's far more nefarious with girls. It's all uh, it, it, if you watch Miss World and you see it's very Machiavelli with girls. <laughs> yes, it, no, but you, if you watch Miss World and you see the runner up, uh, the two runner ups, and they're they're crying and they're really pleased for the person that won it and all that stuff. Are oh, they fuck? They want to scratch their eye, her eyes out. <laughs> But <laughs> they know what there's what they need to put across, and it's the same, you know, right the way through school, through workplaces, through whatever. Uh, heaven forbid you ever work in a fucking uh, factory that's full of full of women because the level of bitchiness is going to be off the charts. You know, one of but, my favorite quotes. I'm not a particular. Sorry, forty two. I'm not a particularly. I've read them a bit. I'm, I'm not going into them much. But Oscar Wilde, the big puff, has got a quote that really resonates. That a man's face is his biography, a woman's face is a work of fiction. And that is so fucking true. <laughs> Sorry, ladies, but it is. Oh, uh, well, when we're going down that road, uh, first date, go to a swimming pool. Yeah. That's the only way you're going to find it, what she actually looks like. <laughs> uh, um, well, well, I'm on that thing. Uh, do you know why women don't video chat after eight o'clock? Because their faces go back to the factory setting. <laughs> <laughs> oh, mate, you're sleeping on the couch tonight, lad. <laughs> 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 if you want, if you want a joke, the wife said to me, oh. "I want." My missus said to me the other night, "I want peace and quiet while I cook the evening dinner." So I took the battery out of the smoke alarm. My <laughs> <laughs> oh. missus on the sofa sleeping, and she just woke up forty-two, and I think you just fell out with her. <laughs> All right. Well, well, okay. If you think that's good, here's another. Uh, here's another take on women. Uh, pierced ears. Nose, nipples, clit, 
waxed eyebrows, waxed uh, pubic area. Did you just say clit? Jesus. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Right, so you've got all these piercings. You've got all this waxing. You've got all this stuff going on. And they say they won't take off the ass because it's sore. Okay, <laughs> <laughs> man. Oh, I guess of all this. It's just well, that, that pain <laughs> threshold they're always boasting about. Yeah. Oh, uh, see, uh, this is the last one I'm going to do. Uh, but see if men could give birth. Paternity test would be mandatory in about a week. Yeah. That's the difference. Uh, the, the pain thing wouldn't change. Uh, men, would, men would say it's like uh, doing an overly large poop, but uh, there would be paternity testing because there's no way women as a class would put up with what do you mean you you want to you want to, what do, what what's this thing where you just say it's men and I have to believe that they would not put up that shit. Toffee, Toffee, that's a whole new meaning of the c word. I have I have to make that point. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're I'm, I'm single. single. I'm forty two and pocket a sleeve on the pants tonight. <laughs> I've got a slight confession to make. I was on Dangerfields the other day and people started complimenting me on how, how well I looked in the chat. And I was like, well, that's lovely. You know, I've had my hair cut and I've grown a bit of a beard and I've bought some new glasses. That's great. But then the other day I went on the stream and I happened to look at my camera settings and there's a setting that says make yourself look better and someone had clicked it on. So <laughs> I, had some ah. kind of filter, I had some kind of filter on. So <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh, well. You do look smart this evening, by the way. Oh, you do. I, went out, I went out. I went for a, a ruby. I was hoping Sensen was going to be about so I could rub it in his face, but he's not here, so. <laughs> if I ever wear a suit as a scouser, you just issue I've been in court. <laughs> I'm only wearing a shirt and a ja jacket. I've got um, suspenders and stockings on at the bottom. You look right. suave, lad. Right, people. Uh, we're coming up in two and a half hours. It's one o'clock in the morning. And... Yeah, and Vincey has managed not to say a single word. You fucking daft cunt, Vince. <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't get a word in edgeways, could I? Really? <laughs> <laughs> Until now. But, uh, well, it's three minutes left. You finish at one. Yeah, well, we're go, uh, we'll go a little past one, but not much. Uh, I have to do that for St. Patrick's Day, although I, don't, I know you don't like it, but it was a Christian missionary who went to tame the Irish and get rid of their snakes. So must have done some good. Well, well, I, I... yeah, I missed the Spitfire part. I'll have to rewatch it when we fin when you finish. Well, anyway, it works all right. I've not you've got no echo, so next time next week can come on. It it it'd be all right. So it's working good. Yes, yeah, so there's the. The echo seems they've gone. Yeah, I would say Parry uh, didn't so much get rid of snakes as he committed a genocide on a religious group. But yeah, we got another ten minutes. Let's uh, discuss that, pagans. shall we? What the Celtic uh, ancient pagans? Anyway, not going into that. Anyway, St Patrick. I am half Irish, but it's a bit of a mix-up. My dad was actually half Scottish, so it doesn't count. I'm British through and through, and I can't change that. I'm not going to go into what you're talking about. It's a bit too depressing. I'm living in London. I'm one of the 37% who's left. I don't notice it too bad because I'm in one of the literally only white areas left in the metropolitan area called London. But what can we do? I can't do nothing about it. I can talk about it, but I don't want to get banged up. What's I'm the uh, yeah? We're already in, in the are you, are, you, are you in the East? Are you in the East End? What's that? Are you in the East End? We are in South West London, Kingston. Oh, right. Was it a posh bit? Well, that's not, that's not East End has long since gone. East End is. Oh, you're yeah. not from. You're not from London. No, East End. Well, London, there's, yeah. no, there's no yeah, white I people there. Man. East End is a complete myth. That's no, that's real. There's no white I people. Used, I used to live in Wapping no. in the 1980s, and it was it's actually pretty, pretty good. Friend, back there. By Tower Bridge. Yeah, man, I've seen. Since, yeah, I know all about this shit. But Kingston's um, not bad. Or wasn't. 
The original immigrants that, don't like either. Bad, the Blacks, yeah. London Blacks don't like what's going on. There well, was postcode wars. There was Somalian gangs fighting with like the ones with crews and all that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The ones with crews weren't all gangsters, crackheads, and they were just doing hip hop break dancing. But the next thing they got to get guns because the Somalians want to chop their heads off with axes and machetes. Yeah, <laughs> Vince made the exactly the same situation in Liverpool. We had like yeah, these black criminals, and then Somalians arrived and just bought the level and of violence. brought it back worse. Made it like voodoo, death, killing, fucking madness. That's because they're Af they're proper Africans. I've heard a rumor. Um, I've heard a rumor as well that the drug dealing comes in. Uh, in Sheffield, the, the usual suspects have had to up the ante on account of the fact that some other people have entered the territory recently and they're getting increasingly more violent with regard to actually, um, you know, applying their trade. And um, there's a there's an area around Sheffield called Burn Grieve. And we've Remain. got, we've, we've, well, the Romas, the Romas are in page Romans four. Are pickpockets galore. Yeah, the Romas are they page four in Sheffield and in Rotherham, the area around Eastwood. Uh, but the new players of your, uh, your uh, 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 um, yeah, they've uh, had to, yeah, I can't hear you, you're breaking up a bit. But anyway, I just wanted to pop on and say hello and uh, say happy St. Patrick's Day again, whatever that means. I don't drink, so I'm not drinking nothing. But if I was going to, I'd have a Caffrey's, not a Guinness. It's much nicer. Well, nice, well, nice, nice to hear, nice from, you. To hear from you, Vincent. What's that? Vincent. I, I said nice to hear from you, Vincent. Yeah. And I'm, I'm sorry to hear about Kingston because when I was there, oh, gosh, not only 10 years ago, it seemed a, re a reasonably decent place. To live. Well, really, it's not now. The rubbish is all over the street. It's Ed Davey, he's an idiot. Well, not really? he, the, the area is no good because he's liberal and the policies that he likes are idiotic, I should say, because he's an MP, he can't be an idiot. You've got to watch your tongue nowadays, and I'm a bit high, yeah. so I drink a lot of coffee, and it's well, like that's... I'm talking to my mates in, in, uh, on the phone or in a pub or whatever. Sure. Well, that's we sad can't. to hear. But my dear, this thing is right because you can delete it or it's in late hours so it doesn't get looked at. Anyway, YouTube like me anyway, really. But what, the, the only options are through legitimate means, which is not just di not voting, but there's other means to take on take back power from the government, which is a fake one at the moment. But I don't think you can because they're all in it. You, you, you can't, you, you're talking about going against King Charles. And... The WEF, you can't, you haven't got the money to do that. I mean, we're just wasting our time going around in circles and stuff. You've got to focus on your own self and your own life and just block it all out as, as any way you can, but without alcohol or class A drugs or with controlled alcohol, but not with abusing it. You know, everything in moderation, whatever it is, chocolate. I can't recommend crack or anything, but some people do it. If they've got the money and can afford it, they just have a little hit every month when they get their wages. They might smoke a gram and it doesn't. Good luck to them. They won't do it the whole <laughs> yeah, why, well, why not? The state of the world as it is, what the reality is behind it. There's nothing wrong with smoking a bit of crack. Not, I'm not saying I could have it. I'd smoke too much. It's the nature of the drug, but people do it. Apparently, some people do heroin and, and get away with it all their lives. Right. Don't um, ever make any scouse insult towards me ever again after you <laughs> just said that. <laughs> What's that? No, London's terrible, man. That's all down here. You must have seen the film Outlaw with what goes on in that film with uh, Michael Caine. That was ages ago. Bob Hoskins. That's a brilliant film to watch. Have you Outlaw. seen that one? Um, I can't think what it's called now. It's, it's got Michael Caine in it and it's on a council yeah, estate. Outlaw, I think. Harry. Yeah. Oh, that, that other one, yeah. They're two at the same time they come out. Harry Brown. Harry Brown. Yeah, that's it. Excellent. It's got the drug uh, dealer in that with the crack and shit. That's sick, man. And you know what's you know, about that film? Like where it's okay. set, black gangs run that estate, and they make yeah, out its white it. criminals, and it's fox. That's Hackney or Islington. Mark was you know, with, and they knocked it all down. One, one real, of my that's real, that's real life, basically. That's a portrayal yeah. of long as it is in, in London. One, yeah. of, one of my most favourite London films was The Long Good Friday. Yeah, I knew you were going to say that. I've I never watched that. 
It's going to be that an eruption. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant film. Yeah, it is the, bar, the, the best the London film, mate, and it's quite possibly the best British film ever made, been. is Nil by Mouth with Ray Winston. Yeah, that's a bit grim and sick. I can't watch that ever again. Yeah, it's a belter film. It's got, Billy Wiz. it's got Billy Wiz in it. He went on in the Essex Boys. So you've got to appreciate that. They link on, don't they, from them East End actors. Yeah. Ray Winston. So Kathy Burke, uh, Kathy Burke was in it. Yeah, and Kathy Burke. I forget his name. He's disappeared a bit. The now. one who was uh, Freddie Foreman's son, Jamie Sean Foreman. Bean. Sean Beams in them as well. Bob Hoskins, Michael Caine, bloody hell. That's there the was a great actor. documentary. It's on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Everything's, everything's black. Not sure what kind is going to be African. I might jump around. I might dodge you what? Mary Poppins is African. Oh, yeah, that's bullshit. They can, you can do that in Africa, release it as the African version, but in England and Northern Europe, Northern Europe, all of Europe should all be, be white characters. That's obvious. They're taking the piss out of humanity. Who are they called? What's that loafer? What's that documentary like? No, the Mike's going for it. No, I can't. Great documentary called Bob Hoskins. London is being sterilized by green. Yeah, that was in the 80s, wasn't it? London, I watched that recently. I watched it recently. 1982. That was 1982, was it? Yeah. Is it on YouTube? Do you reckon? Yeah, it's on YouTube. I watched it the other week, last week, literally. Yeah. Only the other week. All these evil girls oh, really? sold her uh, birthrights to the right. Yeah, it gets angry, doesn't it? He goes, it's not fucking fair. I don't know if he swears. He goes, it's not fair that they come in and buy it all, their gentrification and all that. Because he's, yeah, yeah. he's an East yeah. End originally, isn't he? He's seen it happen to him. Uh, who was he moaning I about then? Arabs? Was, awesome. was he moaning about Arabs who were taking it over and stuff? I can't remember. Yeah, well, Arabs. Yeah. I think it was back then, wasn't it? There were reasons. Re 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 QAEs and stuff. Oh, I was moving about then. I've got my phone. I'll get out of that screen. I don't know if my audio is jumping all over the place. It's okay now. I had my phone next to it. Yeah, I think it's I think it's coming back through Fenton's. Right. Here, people, I have to go to work. Some I have to go to work tomorrow. So I'm gonna wrap this up uh in the next couple of minutes and put nitro on. I'm gonna go around the board for last thoughts. Packer. Excellent stream, 42. Thank you for the uh, spitfire information. Well, I came. Um, yeah, good stream. Nice to talk to you all. Yep, and Jay. Nice chat as well. Uh, Toffee? Yeah, nice to speak to you, 42. Um, Packer, as per. Nice to speak to you, lads, as well. First time I've met you, Sheffield. And always nice to speak to you, Vinci and Rory. So, if you're bored on Monday night at 8 p.m., get over to Sensum's channel and meet him and DJ. Are going to be doing a screen a stream. There's a a, a law coming in currently on the first of April, a Scottish hate crime law. So we're going to be covering that. Yeah, mm. love you. God bless. That'll be interesting. And um, thanks again, Toffee. Uh, Luther Sheffield. Yeah, I was just saying, but basically it's a bit of a deep dive and somebody sent me something on X from Academic Agents stream. Um, it's available on the internet. You don't have to go into the dark web to get it, but you have to beg me for it and you won't blame me if I send it to you. It's a very, big, very, very deep dive about how globalism has disenfranchised the working classes across the formerly developed Western world and it's put us into a fucking quagmire of shit. And I'm complete, complete peak doomer at the moment. After reading it four times, it, it was a very sobering read. And you wonder why I smoke and drink. And I'm finally, just it's nice to run into Rory at long last after all these years. Oh, thank you. I just find it curious that you're for, I presume, the posh part of Sheffield, if you're from posh part, Nick Clegg lost his constituency in Hallamshire, was immediately elevated to was it, the Truth um, Committee of Google or something or other. He basically, 
he lost his constituency in Hallamshire. He moved to California and made about five times as much money about manipulating what evidence and what information we're allowed to control on the internet. I'll leave it there. Excellent. Uh, if you want to go in the description and look up my email and send, send me a link, I would be quite interested. So there you go. That's as, that's as close to begging as I get. <laughs> Listen, you've got to beg for it, mate, because it's a bit of a doomer dive. Honestly, if you want it, I'll put it in StreamYards. There are a, yeah. few, there are a few trigger keywords that might actually skew it um, somewhat. So if you actually, there's about six or seven references to a particular group of people. And if you just actually just close your eyes and count to 10 and think about excluding those trigger words from the from the text and just read it as as the text rolls out then you might have a better idea of what's going on possibly i don't know i i, I yet to, yeah. i yet to remain convinced about it it might be a little bit biased with regard to a certain group of people that really only you know have this the strings of power over what is going on in the world just be skeptical but an awful lot of whatever is mentioned in it rings, sort of rings true. You've got to ask me again, though. I'm going to tell you one more time. Do you want me to put it in StreamYards? Yes, please. Uh, first off, my I'm offended glands have been surgically removed. Uh, I It will not be the worst thing I've read. Uh, I do this stuff myself, and then I disseminate what I take out of it in various ways. That what you're talking about looks like it would be a good blog post. So if you could please put that in, I can gather it up and then have a no have a dive into it. And thank you very much. Yeah, well for me again, I, I I know everyone else on the panel. We're all good mates. Nice to speak to you, mate. You're a good lad. Clever man. Nice to speak to you. I hope to speak to you again. God bless. Rory. Okay, I've sent it. No, beware. Yeah. It's called the the collapse of the American Empire. So, right. if you want to share it, then on your head be it. You ask for it, you've got it. No, what I'm going to do with it is read it and then see what I do with it. If you know what I mean. Uh, uh, if you I do don't... want to discuss it, then it's certainly not oh. suitable for this this platform. Yeah, it would. I'd probably read it and do some form of a blog post about it on WordPress, which is a lot easier with terms and service. Who was that jumped in? Uh, I right. Uh, Roy? Uh, uh, 42. Right, okay. First, firstly, yeah, thank you so much for having me on again. It's always a pleasure. Um, very nice to meet Lev Sheffield and, and speak to him. Um, uh, I would probably finish off just by saying that I am really concerned about. Have you heard about what Michael Gove's been going on about recently? You know, with this new bill to stop basically free speech. Um, well, he, he, he the mentioned extremism bill. The extremism bill. Yeah, where he mentioned patriotic alternative. Uh. Yeah, he's going to in, do that. In, the, in the Houses of Parliament, he mentioned it, but then he can hide behind his. He can tell lies in the Houses of Parliament because he has parliamentary privilege. So he can uh, say what everybody bloody well likes. And that, that, and most of what he said, in fact, all of what he said was completely untrue. I and mean, that really annoyed me. But um, sorry, just a little political point for you before you close your stream now. Yeah. Not a problem. Uh, I need to have a proper dive through. I'll probably read that whenever it gets goes through as a bill, and we we'll get the whole document. But well, it's quite a lot of it. It's quite a lot of it, you know, on the on the internet. But um, no, yeah. Yeah, I, anyway, forty-two. Thank you so much for letting me on. No and, and thank you for letting me on earlier, just to talk about Sir Douglas Barber. That was very kind of you. Thank you. No worries, and always a pleasure. Fence, what about you, chum? Uh, 
I mess around with headphones, but they, my ones don't work when it's on StreamYard for some reason. You have to plug it in. Anyway, it's not echoing. It might be when Packer's speakers might echo back because he's got his mic on. Possibly. No, Packer's mic's off. There's no echo now. Yeah, I think it was just that. It's echoing back off the room. Mm. So I speak loud, maybe. Am I quite loud speaking? Not really. Right. Just all right. Anyway, yeah. So I missed the first hour, all the Spitfire bit. I'm going to watch it in a minute. Once you finish, I'm going to rewind it up yep. to... I missed an hour and a bit, I think. I have five minutes, that's all. Well, the good news is this one's still on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. There's no we don't need to do the flip this week. No, I missed that, sorry. So I was probably getting some tobacco. Uh, no, last, on last week. Last week's it's one good. had to had to get moved a bit shit because <laughs> it got just a little bit too spicy. I don't know if I watched that. I think I missed that one as well. Actually, I have to watch that. Yeah, it it got moved over on the bed shit because uh, or it came in right near the end or something. So I missed most. Yeah, of it. Okay. last half hour maybe or forty five minutes I was there. Right. I can't remember well, what it's about. I'm losing my memory. The week's going by so fast now. I don't know how you keep up with it. It's good. You've been doing it yeah. a long time, I suppose. It's so it's easier. I, I start thinking about next week's show on a Monday. Okay. So um, what... calendar helps things that reoccur yeah. in events in the calendar, obviously. Yeah. Cool. I'm, I'm trying to not do last year's content this year. Not exactly, so... no. There's plenty out there, isn't there? Yeah. Other things. Uh, I mean, what's yeah. happened to Chris? Is, been to, is Chris coming back, I think? Is he starting to start streaming again, possibly? Yeah, he, he is. Uh, Chris seems to be ha having a hell of a lot of busyness with work and stuff. He's, yeah, he's got business and his book and stuff. Yeah. No problem, so he can't do it that much. Two or three times a week, maybe, not every day. Yep. Right. Yeah. Okay, okay. I'm going anyway, to up. nice to talk to you. I'll get I'll get in next time, and I don't know. Yeah, be more prepared. Oh, that was a cracker poem you wrote. You wrote about the Nagler, by the way. Oh yeah, that wasn't me. I don't know if you know. It wasn't actually me. It was AI. All right. That was my second AI poem that I used to prompt. It just said, write me a poem. The first one was about um, Mark Dubpower said alpha male. I just put in heterosexual male instead because that's the proper term. And it came out still as an alpha male poem. And it's really good because I was using Gab AI chat thing instead of chat GTP, GPT, which is owned by Microsoft, isn't it? Yeah. So you won't get, you won't get what you want. And then the second one was about niggling Billy. And it, it wrote it as a boy rather than a man, but it still fitted to him anyway. So it's funny enough. And everyone loved yeah. that. Did you see that one? And that's yeah. the one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah sorry. Someone... Yeah, yeah but you're right. That. It isn't, the prose isn't, it isn't laid out properly. And the, when it stops, it isn't laid out. And I think there might be a mistake in it as well. Uh, something, spelling mistake or the wrong word is used for the meaning. I have to have a look at it again. But that's AI not being perfect. And if you paid for a premium one, it probably fix it for you without you having to fix it. I think that's yeah. what it is. They put bugs in it on purpose. So you've got to pay for the good one. That's, that's what it is with the artwork anyway. You've got to pay to do the alterations, either yourself or it does it for you. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I'm not paying. I just... I just do it myself or just regenerate one until you get one that hasn't got the imperfections. It's always on their hands, isn't it? And on their eyes. If it's a person, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? It's just, what's that thing with the cake? It's saying it's wrong fingers and stuff. And it was true. I wasn't sure myself. What the hell? Apparently the photo of that Kate Middleton, it was from two years ago or longer from the cover of Vogue. Unbelievable. Well, the memes that are going around on Twitter are absolutely fucking hilarious. Yeah, one with big boobs, one with Sadiq, get Sadiq Khan out, or get Khan out. Have you seen that one? <laughs> yeah, the one with Jimmy Savile, Rolf Harris as well. Oh, sat yeah. in the lap. That Jimmy, looks that quite Jimmy Savile as Camilla. Like Jimmy no, Parker Bowles or Camilla the, Savile. Like. The, the one I've been seeing is the Vaubin and the Labour Ox. Oh, well, that, the Rangers. Yeah. <laughs> Also, I haven't seen that. Memes are funny, though. Sometimes you can be a bit sad and down. You see a good handful of memes, and it makes you laugh your head off, and you feel happy for the rest of the week or the rest of the day, at least. They're great. It's the, model, it's the new form of ultra-high comedy, isn't it, through memes? Yep. Because they won't let us do stand-up anymore properly. 
Anyway, it will come back. It's just a turn yeah. of events and all these things. Right. I don't know. I'm not saying any more than that. It's and like, with that, we'll go to work, man. It's nearly 4:20. It is. It's nearly 4:20. And 4 20 in, the... in 30 seconds or so. <laughs> Right. So, yeah, happy 420, man. I'll speak to you soon. Yep. Yes. Cheers, brother. And a happy a good night to all, and happy afternoon or whatever it is in what other parts of the world whoever's listening. You take care, and God bless everyone. Bye-bye. Right, bye. No. God bless you, too. Good night. You, Why is this not working? Uh-huh. It's... Crap. For some unknown reason, this is not going to present for me. So, I'm going to have to do a different song. Uh, one moment, though. We're going to go with Eat the Bugs. 42 speaking. Welcome to the resistance. Oh shit man, eat the bugs, you got me wrong, you got me so wrong, you ever seen a cave drawn, of somebody with a spear, hunting a mosquito, well me either, we meet and we have choices, you think the hedgehog right, it tastes like chicken, fucking chicken, I ain't eating your bugs, I ain't eating your bugs, I started off with nothing, now I'm never going back. I'm not getting on your progressive track. With Agenda 2030, I refuse to engage. I can see where it is going, and it's just another cage. I've got hedgehog, I've got rabbit, I've got wild hog. Fuck it, I can even move to Alaska and get me a nice caribou. Away while I fought so hard to get, so I'm going to say no to your cattle car train. Eat the bugs, live in some communal pod with no fucking privacy. Oh, nothing will be happy. I've seen the people with nothing and they don't look happy. Eat the bugs, live in some communal pod with no fucking privacy. Oh, nothing will be happy. I'm not eating your bugs. Fuck it. I'm not eating your bugs. Fuck it. I'm not eating your bugs. Fuck it. Fuck it. You got me wrong, you got me so fucking wrong. There are millions of us in the UK, billions worldwide, unvaccinated, striding out into our third winter of death with not a cur in the world. Eating pig, eating cow, eating chicken, and we will not conform. Fuck it, I'm not eating your bugs. Hey, Klaus Wall, this is 42, and I want the word with you. Motherfucker.
charge a stone hinge, keeping me away from the stones. That's not word birdies, that's British hurdies. You're getting to the point where the people are just walking to the left room and going to get involved. Tell me again, why is the United Nations running some hinge? Okay, everybody, uh, the guests have been the guests. I've been 42, and you lot in the chat have, as always, been fucking amazing. Thank you. Good night. God bless. See you all next week. I'm out of here. Goodbye.